School of Evangelism. We started this school in 2018, and we have approximately 265 churches of Christ enrolled in our school. And our school is a full-time school that trains churches how to reach the lost. And um, I want to give you a little background before we get started. Um, and so it was never my intention to start a school of evangelism. And uh, so if someone had said uh, seven years ago, hey, Rob, you're going to step out of full-time work and start a school of evangelism, I would have laughed. I'd have said, no, that's not what I'm going to do. And, um, but because of um, some persistent um, uh, encouragement from uh, uh, Alan Webster and Don Blackwell, I eventually uh, capitulated and we began this work. And uh, so this work has uh, um, uh, grown beyond any expectation it was a trial balloon. We let it go wherever the Lord uh, was going to take it. And uh, we step back um, uh, now, looking back over the last six years, and uh, we stand in amazement at uh, what God has done. And so we were at the Petersville Church of Christ each evening. And so if you're able to visit Petersville, you will get some of this information. The church there is enrolling in the school. Uh, locally, the Hatton Church of Christ, where Chris Miller preaches, is enrolled in the school, and they've had incredible um, um, results as, a, as, as, as they have uh, followed and trusted the process and reached out to the lost. But once again, we're grateful to be here, and I know some of you are joining us online, and so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so if you'll subscribe to a House to House a School of Evangelism on your YouTube, so if you have a smartphone, take your smartphone. Go ahead and subscribe to that channel because we're going to give you 111 videos. They're five-minute videos. And they're designed to train. They are training videos. So they're broken up into a playlist which uh, categorizes our model. And so those are very important. We need you to have access to these. And so after you have subscribed to that, I want you to go ahead and go to um, this QR code with your smartphone. And uh, you need to... Um, uh, give me your email address and your name. And uh, if you do not know how to use a QR code, it's all right. For the last 6,000 years, we have, uh, we have written things down. And you can just give me your name and email address, and I'll be glad to insert it for you. But the QR code allows us to get that done um, uh, more efficiently. And what we're going to do is we're going to send you evangelism training material. So we want to train. We want to give you the material. We'd like to give you as much material for free as possible. And we do that using the QR code in your email. So in your inbox, you're going to get uh, routinely evangelism materials that you can teach, that you can uh, use to encourage, that you can use to uh, reach the lost. This is our website, evangelism.housetohouse.com. There are also some tools on that website. And this allows you to enroll your local church. So if you enroll your local congregation, we will contact you and we will set up a date where we can arrive. We have between a 12 and 24 month waiting period. So we train 45 congregations a year. Uh, the Petersville Church is the 16th church this year already that we have trained. And so we spend about 200 nights a year in a hotel room, my family, and we go around the country and we just train churches. And we're looking forward to providing that training here at Heritage to the students and those who come from the local area. The School of Evangelism is not a brick and mortar school. We bring the training right to your congregation. And so you don't have to, um, you don't have to send your members. You can, you, can, you can just attend a local church. We'll bring it to your congregation. We'll provide the foundational training. And then we're going to give you access to our online curriculum. The only way you get access to that is to go through our training. Once you go through our training, we will submit to you a link. And that provides you access to the nuts and bolts of our school. The website is a modular website. It takes you through the process one step at a time. And I will cover that tomorrow. And that is really the, 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 the operational uh, side of the evangelism school. It's the executable file. So all the preaching and the sermons and the motivation is good. And I think we need to begin there. But it's not going to result in souls being saved if we don't make it operational, if we don't do anything. So if the members are looking at you, what do I do? And I loved your sermon, and I agree with it, but what do I do? We need to have that operational side, and that's where the website comes in to play. Proverbs 11.30 says, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. There's not a wiser course of action to take than for um, a church to focus on the mission. 
Brethren, we have one mission this morning. There's just one. And it's called the Great Commission because there's just one. God didn't give you two missions. He just gave you one. And it's very succinctly stated in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. And so that commission is stated in Mark 16, 15, and 16. Go preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. It's stated in Luke 24, 44 through 49. John 21, 20 through 23. It's stated in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It's stated in just about every book of the Bible, either by explicit or through example, you see that commission being emphasized. I cannot emphasize enough that we need to focus on the mission given by Christ. It's the great commission because there's just one. There's not two, there's just one. And if we fail in the Great Commission, we have failed completely because that is the only commission we have. And, and, and so if we're going to be effective in fulfilling uh, the mission of Christ, we've got to focus on what he has said. Now, in that commission, I want to go ahead and begin with the concept because this is something that most of our churches miss. So in order for the Great Commission to work, we have to key in on the very words of the commission. Jesus said, go ye, okay? The term go ye does not mean just go me. And I respect uh, Brother Ivan Stewart, and I love the book. Go ye means go me. But there's more to it than just me. Go ye means go all. And if the whole church is not participating, if we don't get congregational participation and buy him, if we don't have a congregational model, if we don't practice congregational evangelism, it fails. You cannot expect the preacher to carry the load. The preacher is not the evangelist of the church. He's a, an evangelist. And so the model of Matthew 28 must be congregational. We must get our members trained. We must engage them. It cannot just fall upon the lap of an eldership. It's got to come to every member of the church. And one of the reasons we fail in evangelism is because we bring a team of Navy SEALs in or we train five people of a 200 and we expect them to carry the load and they fail. It doesn't work that way. Your preacher can't do it alone. Your youth minister can't do it alone. The eldership can't do it alone. No one can do it alone. So we're not going to come and train five people how to do a Bible study. We're going to train 205. We're going to, whoever it is, we're going to do it on Sunday morning. We're not going to do it on Tuesday night at six o'clock when you lose 90% of your membership. We're going to do it on Sunday morning when they sit in the pews and they're not going to have a choice. In fact, we're going to be so, we're going to be so um, intense and intentional. If the membership in the pews doesn't participate, all right, they're going to be, they're going to, they're going to be ashamed. They're going to have to deliberately just kind of hide because we're going to place it right out in front of them and we're going to beg and we're going to plead and we're going to ask them to participate. We're going to give them actionable things to do. And so in a congregational model, you're not just training personal evangelists, you're training the church how to do it. Remember Ephesians 3, 9, and 10. To this intent that now into principalities and powers and heavenly places, it might be made known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. It's not the job of one person, it's the job of the church. It's the job of the church to evangelize. So we can't hire a missionary. We don't hire one guy. He's our evangelism guy. You can't hire this one out. You can't, you can't throw money at it and expect it to work. All right? You can't, you can't have schools do it. Heritage Christian University can't evangelize for the kingdom. All right? It doesn't matter uh, who you are. You cannot replace the very instructions Jesus gave in Matthew 28. Go ye means go everyone. He's plural. It's not singular. So this is the wisest course of action for a church to take. Every church of Christ needs to focus on the mission. And any church of Christ who's not focused on the mission is a church of Christ who's not going to make it. And so we're going to see that abundantly clear. So let's go ahead and get started. In the year 2000, we had 13,155 churches of Christ. In the year 2009, we had 12,629 churches of Christ. In 2015, we had 12,300 churches of Christ. In 2018, we had 11,965 churches of Christ. In 11, uh, 2021, we had 11,905 churches of Christ. I just spoke 
to the organization that compiles these numbers. Currently, we're losing one Church of Christ every three days. They're going to put those numbers out at the end of the year. COVID was a lagging number. I believe when we see the numbers at the end of this year, all of us are going to stand and we're going to be cut to the heart because what we're seeing is a constant and steady decline from those who are from the churches of Christ in America. And so any, any football team that had a record like this, if, if the University of Alabama had a football team with a record like this, if your new coach performed like this, you would fire him. You would never allow this to be stand. You would address it immediately. There would be, a meeting, there, there would be emergency board meetings. This room would be full of elders and preachers from a place in America that's the most populated with Christians anywhere in the world. Where are they? Because we're so distracted with our graduation banquets. We're distracted with oh, our teachers' appreciation days. We're distracted with VBS preparations, Bible camp preparations. Brethren, I could give you the list. And at the end of the day, how many Christians come from your graduation banquet? How many baptisms are going to result? I'm not against graduation banquets, but I'm just saying we're the most distracted people on earth. And until our elderships, until our pulpits begin to realize that evangelism is the focal point on the mission of the church, brethren, these numbers are going to get worse. I fear they're going to get far worse before we get the attention of the churches. And I think for some it's going to be too late. In fact, for some churches right now, it's too late. You have waited so long. You have no resources. You don't have enough membership. You're at a point now where the only thing you can do is close your doors. But let's look at membership. The year 2000, 1,265,000 church members. 2009, 1,224,000 church members. 2015, 1,180,000 church members. 2018, 1,128,000 church members. 2021, 1,112,000 church members. What's going on? We're losing membership. Yes, we can hide. We can hide at polishing the pulpit. And we can be encouraged by the 5,000. We can go to, we can go to our, um, our conferences, our youth conferences, and see 10,000. Yes, we can go to lads to leaders and be surrounded by Christians and pat each other on the back. And brethren, we're counting our own people. <laughs> we're counting our own people. This is not an indicator to church growth. Just because you get more churches involved doesn't mean you're, the kingdom is growing. Brethren, we're cannibalizing the church of Christ. In Florence, Alabama, is it not true that churches cannibalize? They take membership from one church to another church. They just switch. You've got probably 300 church members that just roam around. And we cannibalize one church to another church. Oh, we're growing. You're not growing. You're having roster growth. You're not having kingdom growth. At the expense of one church, you're getting membership from another church. Since when has that been a measure of growth? That's not a measure of growth. That's not what God talks about in the Great Commission. And so, so, so just because a little church shuts their door and you pick up 20 members, you've not grown. The kingdom hasn't grown at all. What we've done is lost another church of Christ, and we're seeing that happen all over the nation. We're living in a bubble. We're, we're fooling ourselves by trying to convince uh, others, well, we're okay. We're, everything's never been better. Brethren, things have never been worse. Uh, sometimes I wonder if, if we have the prophets like in the Old Testament that are telling Israel, everything's okay, don't worry about it. Oh, I know you see Assyria coming, you'll be okay, don't worry. <laughs> everything's fine. <laughs> Brethren, everything's not fine. What we're finding is the Church of Christ is losing ground. Uh, we're hemorrhaging church members, and we can look at it historically. 1906, we had a ratio of 1 to 535. That means one Christian for every 535 people. We had 85 million mem citizens in the United States of America, 85 million people. We had 159,000 members of the Lord's church. That's a pretty, those are big numbers. So we just put in a ratio to, to, to give us a, a framework. Well, let's watch what happens 40 years later. We have 141 million people in the country, 682,000 members. Now the ratio is 1 to 207. Find it interesting, in 40 years, we cut it in half. And what happened then seven years later? Seven years, just seven years, we did it again. 
We cut it in half. Now we're 1 to 106. Now look at the numbers. They don't lie. They, they indicate what? Growth. They indicate growth. All right? And it doesn't matter how you parse those numbers, the church is growing. The church keeps growing. Now we're 1967. Now we're down to 1 to 84. We keep that going on through the 1970s, 1 to 84. Our church buildings were full. We literally had teams of men who traveled the nation, and their only job was to build church buildings. That's what they did. They just built church buildings. And uh, the old A-frame church buildings, I know, Kurt, you've seen a lot of those in your travels. You know, the Bible classes are on the side. You know, Pennington Bend, the elongated auditorium. We built those all over the nation. That's what they did. It's all they did. Where are they? <laughs> They're not in existence. We're not building church buildings. We're closing buildings. So what happened during that period of time? We evangelized. Oh, I want you to think about the evangelistic era of the church. 1950s, Jewel Miller. 1960s. We have Ivan Stewart. 1970s, Bobby Bates. What did those men do? Mid McKnight, Owen Albright. I mean, we can start naming the great soul winners. They emphasized evangelism. They actually traveled the nation and they taught people how to, to reach the lost. And there's a lot of other soul winners I'm leaving out. But during that period of time, we got it. In fact, in the night, there was a period of time where we were the fastest religious growing body in America. Don't take my word for it. In 1953, the American College Dictionary changed the definition of Christian to include the Church of Christ because we were growing so quickly. They added the Church of Christ into the definition. No other religion was mentioned but the Church of Christ. They did that in 1953. They carried that definition all the way through the 50s. Why? Because one out of every 84 people was a member of the Church of Christ. There's never been a more influential movement. You, 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 you notice, do we not see that we grew during the Spanish flu? We didn't decrease during the Spanish flu, an epidemic far worse than COVID. We increased during it. We didn't decrease during World War I. We increased. We didn't decrease during the Great Depression. We increased. We didn't decrease during World War II. We increased. We didn't decrease during Korea, Vietnam, the feminist movement, civil rights, the Cold War. What did we do during those periods of time? Brethren, we grew. Where are we now? We're at 1 to 289. We've dropped from 2.5 million to barely a million people left. And I think that's very generous. They're very broad sometimes in their definitions. I, 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 I wouldn't be... I, I, at the end of this year, I would not be surprised at all if we've dropped below a million members of the Lord's church left. I cannot emphasize strongly enough this morning how important this topic is. I travel the nation and all we do is train churches. I go to places like Missouri and uh, New Hampshire and uh, Kansas and Nebraska. I go to places where you got to drive two hours to find a church of Christ. Brethren, those churches get it. Do you know what happens when I pull into an area like that? People literally drive for hours. I mean, they literally drive for hours just to get there. The attendance is unbelievable. I go to an area that's surrounded by churches of Christ. I just left McMinnville. There's 47 churches of Christ in that area. Guess how many people show up to be trained? I come to Florence, Alabama. I mean, this is Jerusalem of the Church of Christ. Where are they? Brethren, we're cannibalizing our churches. In fact, I just had an eldership in McMinnville tell me, hey, Rob, we picked up some members. I said, well, I said, well great, you're growing. I, I, I said, how many baptisms? Oh, no, a church closed their door. We picked up 30. Brethren, that's hardly a celebration. That's hardly something that we should pat ourselves on the back for. And so, yes, and I've heard, I, yes, I, I get it. You know, well, we got too many churches out there. You know, they're, we're not in the horse and buggy era anymore. I, I've heard that for years. As though we're trying to excuse the closing of the churches. What's going to happen when they close down in the cities? What's going to happen when the churches, what, what, what are we going to, what are we going to say? We got too many churches? So the problem is we have too many church buildings. <laughs> but no, the problem is we don't have enough Christians. The problem is we're, we're around focused on the mission. I, I met with a preacher today from this area. I said, brother, what's your strength? And he went, he listed them. 
I said, what's your weakness? He says, everything we do is inward. It's all about us. I mean, he was honest. He said, Rob, that's our weakness. He said, it's all about us. If I were to take the average calendar for a church of Christ and dissect it, brethren, I could write your calendar. I mean, I could, I could literally write the calendar for most churches of Christ. We all do the same thing. I mean, I could start with January and say, you're going to start pew packers. You're going to do some kind of you know, activity trying to engage your, your children. February, you're going to have a marriage retreat. We, we've got to have it. You know, it's, it's Valentine's. We've got to have our marriage retreat. We've got to have some marriage camp. We've got to have some seminar on marriage. March, spring meeting. We've got to have, you know, we've got to start invigorating the, the brethren. We're coming out of the winter. You know, April, we've got to have our Easter egg hunt. We don't call it that. We call it maybe the spring party. Um, and so we're going to have our spring party for the kids. We're, we're going to do more gospel meetings. Uh, we're going to have VBS preparations. We're going to do Bible camp preparations. We're going to go into May. Okay, we're going to have our graduation banquet. We're all hands on deck for that. We don't want to disappoint the teenagers because we're going to lose them. And then we're going to go into June. We're going to have our VBS, our summer series, our youth rallies. We're going to have our Bible camps. We're going to do that through June and July. We're going to run ourselves in circles trying to keep up. We're going to have everybody participating. It feels really good because the membership is engaged. There's a lot of activities going on. Our preachers are gone from almost week to week speaking somewhere about some subject. In August, Teachers Appreciation Day, backpack drives. Let's get ready for school. Let's supply the local community with the supplies that they need. All along, no baptisms, almost no conversions. We're cannibalizing our churches. I could write your calendar this morning. And if I was on a board, and I, I'm, I'm certainly not on, a, on any board, but if I was on a financial board and I looked at my stockholders, my stockholders might ask me, what's the bottom line? How much money have you made me? I've made this investment. Show me your return on investment. Give me results. Oh, we had, we passed out 75 backpacks. Give me the results. How many Bible studies did you get out of those 75 backpacks? How many conversions happened? Show, show, show me something. Brethren, when is there going to be some accountability? When is there going to be a time when we're accountable for the very things that we're doing? Brethren, we're losing. We're losing this war. There's a battle for the very soul of the church of Christ in America, and we're losing. Again, if it was your football team, you'd fire your coach. If, 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 if this was the CEO, he'd immediately be voted out. But in the church, we, we've done this for four decades. And there are more excuses for church loss than there are for kids that lose their homework. And everybody has some reason as to why. But the bottom line is we're still losing. Look at the numbers. I don't, I don't invent the numbers. I don't create them. I don't know a brotherhood work out there that doesn't see it. Every director, president of a college, everybody I talk to, they see it. There's less churches supporting the work. There's, there, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are congregations that are no longer sending us their students because they're not there. The money dries up. One of our Christian universities did a study. It was not long ago. And they wanted to find out what, what things look like. And I'm going to show you the results. They wanted to find out what the future looked like for their university. They were concerned that maybe there would not be enough, I don't know, students to populate their, their, their fat facilities. And because they see at preaching schools the same thing, they see that they're having less and less response. So the question is why? Uh, why, did, why, did we, um, why did we start this school? Uh, why am I here? Uh, I preached full time for 22 and a half years. It was never my plan to do this. Um, I, I, didn't know what it, I didn't know what it meant to, to start a school of evangelism. When Alan Webster says, Rob, you need to start a school of evangelism, I said, what's that? <laughs> what is a school of evangelism? Um, so, so why would I step out of full-time work? I, I, I literally bought my wife's dream home. I literally did that. I saved and saved and saved as a preacher, you know, trying to just put together what I could. I got to Willette after a year or so. I, I, I said, Nicole, I think we can do it. So we built our home where I was going to stay the rest of my life. By our cemetery plots. I was there 11 and a half years. 
And um, I went to my wife and I, I said, honey, I said, we've got to do this. And so I literally took Sarah from the Ur of the Chaldees, the most sophisticated, by the way, city in the world at that time. You know, it's where they, I think they formed the, the you know, a square root. I mean, it was a very sophisticated place. And Abraham says, Sarah, we're leaving. Where are we going? I don't know. Uh, by the way, your, your, your comforts of life are about to leave. We're going on the road. And why in the world would a preacher do that? I can tell you when I saw those numbers, they hollowed me out. When they hollowed me out, I said, not on my watch. And if, if you think, Alan Webster, if you think I can help churches you know, wake up, if you, if you think we can be effective, if you think we can help turn this ship, I'm all in. And that's what we've tried to do. It all started with Chris Coyle. He started it. I was sitting in my office. I got a phone call from Chris. I don't know Chris. He's a, he's a preacher. I understand maybe some connections to Heritage Christian University with his dad. But I don't know him, never met him. He calls me and he says, hey, Rob. He says, I, uh, he says you're the preacher at Willette. I said, I am. He said, I'm the preacher at Somerville. I said, well, nice to meet you. We talked for a few minutes. He said, Rob, I got a new member uh, at, at Somerville. Her name is, uh, their names are William and Scarlett Mitchell. I said, okay. I said, great. And he said, Rob, she's from your area. I said, well, I don't know him. She said, Rob, she became a Christian when she was dating William. I said, okay. And uh, I said, uh, Chris, what do you need me to do? He says, well, her mom and dad are Jackie and Sheila Bergwell. Rob, they live in your area. She's been discussing the church and, uh, and uh, Christ with them. And uh, Rob, she asked me if I could reach out to a preacher in their area to conduct a Bible study with Jackie and Sheila Bergwell. I said, that's great, Chris. You call the right guy. I love evangelism. Nothing excites me more than a Bible study. I said, Chris, what day is the study scheduled for? He says, well, we haven't set a day yet. I said, that's not a problem. I said, Chris, morning, noon, or night. I said, uh, I'll, I'll be there. I said, when did they request the study? He says, well, they haven't yet. And I looked at Chris. I said, Chris, I, 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 said, I, I don't understand. I said, you want me to go do a Bible study with two people who got requested a Bible study? How do you suppose I do that? He says, really not sure about that, Rob, but I'll let Scarlett know that I called you. Good luck. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> I love Chris, by the way, but he was about as clueless as I was about how to make this work. And um, I got off the phone. I wrote down Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. You know, I'm looking at I'm thinking to myself, you know, what am I going to do to show up at the door? My name's Rob Whitaker. I'm here to do a Bible study. I mean, how's that going to work? It's just not going to work. And so I, um, I took that piece of paper, and I'm ashamed of this. I crunkled it up and threw it away. I put it in my waste paper basket. You know why? Because I got to get back to the important things, like folding church bulletins. Brother, are you a preacher? I am. All right. Kirk, you preached. You preached at Central. I was just at Central, McMinnville. I know, Travis, you've done some preaching. Brother, I don't know if you've done any preaching or not, but I can tell you this. Try to go four weeks and not do a church bulletin. Don't write an article. Don't fold your bulletin and see if you keep your job. Now, go four weeks and don't do a Bible study. I'm asking, do you keep your job, Travis? Kirk, do you keep your job? Brother, do you keep your job? Brother, you, you know, you can go, not weeks, you can go months and years and never conduct a personal Bible study and keep your job. You can't go four weeks. You can't go a week without having the bulletin done and keep your job. Now, you tell me where our priorities are at. You, you tell me where we're at in the church because we're not, we're not where we need to be. Because we're, we're paying our preachers to fold bulletins. We're paying our preachers to do things that they're... That, that, uh, and I don't mind doing the bulletin. Listen, I, I, I've done the bulletin... <laughs> I preached for churches of 300 plus, and I still did the bulletin. I still folded it. I, I, I formatted it. I, I authored it. I don't mind. If that's what the brethren want me to do, if you think that's the best use of my talents, then I'll do it. I sat in my office and I said, Rob Whitaker, you cannot leave here and have two souls in your trash can. So I pulled them out. I put it back on my desk and I laid it there. And I went home. I went through my Sunday routine. Sunday morning Bible class, Sunday sermon, nursing home, Sunday evening sermon. That got in bed, can't sleep. The reason I couldn't sleep is because my conscience bothered me. 
I got, to the, I got back to the um, office, and I'm sitting there at my desk, and, um, and I, 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 brethren, I don't know what to do. I got two souls staring at me. I got a, a sister here, Scarlett, who wants me to do a Bible study. Chris Coyle said, Rob, do a Bible study. Brother, I don't know how to get to Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. I don't know how to do it. Let me give you my background a little bit. I grew up in the church of Christ. My mother's a secretary. Brother, I grew up in the church building. I grew up around some of the best preaching a man could hear. I, I heard, heard Wendell Winkler, Guy Woods. Thomas Moran, Roy Deaver. I mean, I remember here, Johnny Ramsey. I mean, I mean, here's some of the great preachers of the past. Andrew Conley. I mean, I, I mean these guys could... I mean, I, I was at the feet of some of the greatest preachers we had. I go to school of preaching. I go to Christian universities. I get my walls surrounded with degrees. I'm asked to speak at every lectureship under the sun. I mean, I really thought I had arrived when spiritual sword in Memphis and, you know, and, and, and East Tennessee School of Preaching in Florida and all these places saying, hey, come speak. I really thought, man, this is, this is what preaching's all about. I couldn't have been more wrong. I'm sitting in my office and I don't know how to reach two sinners. Something is wrong. And I bowed my head and I said, God, help me. I, I, I felt alone. Um, I felt helpless. I didn't know who to call. I didn't even know who to ask. Who is it that I'm going to ask? Who's going to help me? Because I don't, I don't know that they have an answer either. I prayed. I said, God, I need help. I don't know what to do. I prayed for courage. I prayed for strength. I prayed for forgiveness. I got done with my prayer and I... I, I, I I sat there for a minute. I said, you know what? I said, I can't have a pity party. It's not going to help. God's not going to snap his finger and just put him in my office. I'm going to get ready for this. And so what I did is I said, God, uh, I said, I'm going to study how Jesus would reach Jackie and Sheila. What would he do? He's the greatest evangelist who ever lived. He never preached too long. He never preached too short. Whatever Jesus did was perfect. And I'm figuring, hey, if, if the Lord did it, that's what I need to do. That's where my journey began. I had no idea where it was going to take me. And I wanted to find out what made Jesus the greatest evangelist the world's ever seen. And I, as I studied the Bible studies of Christ, and that's what I was looking for, his encounters with lost people, what he said, how did he say it, how did he approach them. Here's what I noticed. There are things that Jesus does consistently. He always does them. He, he, uh, every time he meets somebody, he does some very similar things. And the things that I did that I thought made me pretty good, he doesn't do those things. <laughs> and so I began to, to formulate what I call the seven principles of evangelism. So our school is founded on one mission, six steps, and seven principles. One mission, six steps, and seven principles. That's how our school is formed. All right? Those seven principles come right from the life of Christ. I want to teach them to you. So, so as I'm developing these, uh, a young man by the name of Jonathan Smith comes home from college. He was graduating from the University of Tennessee, and he got a job at Clay County Schools. This is up in um, uh, Macon, Clay County. And he said, hey, Rob, I'm home. I've graduated. I said, great, Jonathan. Glad to have you home. I know your family's excited. I'm glad to see you. Hey, I met this young lady at Carnes where uh, Steve Higginbotham preaches. Her name's Elizabeth. We're getting married. And I said, that's wonderful. I said, hey, Rob, hey, man, I, 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 I've got to go. He said, I've got to go because I've got to go meet my best friend, Evan Burkle. Wait a minute. Evan Burkle. Hey, wait. He, hey, uh, Jonathan, is he related to Jackie and Sheila Burkle? He said, yeah, that's like, hey, hey, Rob, that's like my second set of parents. He's, uh, he's my best friend, Rob. I said, great, take me with you. It was spontaneous. I really didn't even think about it. I said, just, just put me in the car with you. And he did. I got in the car. We're going. Up. He said, hey, Rob, why do you want to meet Jackie and Sheila Burkle? I said, well, I'm going to convert them. You're going to what? I said, we're going to convert them. How are you going to do that? I said, I don't know. I said, but I need you to get me in the house. I said, if you get me in the house, I got, I've, got a, I've got something I want to try. I'm going to take those seven principles, and I'm going to, I'm going to try them. He gets, he gets to the door, knocks on it. Sheila opens it up, and she wraps him up. Jonathan! I mean, she wraps him up, and she doesn't even see me. And Jackie comes to the door, shaking Jonathan's hand. She finally sees me. She says, Jonathan, who do you got with you today? Oh, that's just a friend of mine, Rob Whitaker. I thought I did. Well, you, any friend of Jonathan's a friend of mine. Come on in. Like any good Southern woman, she had sweet tea and chocolate chip cookies waiting. 
We sat around the table. We just, we just ate. We just, uh, you know, we just, uh, you know, got to know each other. 20, 30 minutes, just small talk, right? And then we came to the awkward moment. You know what the awkward moment is? No one knows what to say. She looks at me and she says, uh, sir, who are, you, who, who are you again? I said, my name's Rob Whitaker, and I'm the preacher for the Willette Church of Christ. Jackie, the preacher for the Church of Christ is in this house. I mean, at that very moment, I mean, it just lit a storm. And I said, well, Sheila, I said, I think you have some questions for me. And I just wanted to, to come over and meet you. And, and uh, let, do you have any questions? I sure do. And she let them rip. I mean, like she had rehearsed them. It's like she memorized them. One question after another question after. Now, let me, let me tell you where I'm at. Prior to my study, I would take every question, I would dissect it, and I would give an answer. And if need be, I would win the debate. And I'm very capable of doing that. Okay. If I need to use Greek, I'll use Greek. If I need to put a syllogism, I'll use my syllogism. If I, if I need to quote Thayer, I'll quote Thayer. If I need to quote Bauer, I'll quote Bauer. If I need to bring out Reinecker, I'll bring out if I need to If I need to quote all the verses in the New Testament, I'll quote them. I love to win. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to completely change the way I do it. It goes against really everything I've ever seen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to defer every question she asks. I'm not going to answer. And I've noticed through the years that, that, uh, that answering people's questions doesn't always result in a, in a Bible study. In fact, normally it doesn't. So I, I, I took her question and I said, uh, Sheila, that's a, that's a pretty cool question. Why would you ask that? And I started asking her questions about her question. And as I did this, she would engage me. She would ask. And she didn't really, it was not, I was not rude Please understand, I'm not sitting there like a knot on the log, staring at her as she asks questions and, and just not saying anything. I'm talking to her, but I'm doing it very conversationally. I'm just, you know, asking questions. We do this for 10, 15 minutes, and she finally looks at her husband. She says, Jackie, why won't he answer my questions? Man, that was good. I, I, when she said that, I knew we're right where we need to be. I said, Sheila, I said, that's a pretty good observation. I said, you know, I'm not a very good teller. But I'm a pretty good shower. I said, hey, would it be okay if we open our Bibles and I'll let you find the answers? <gasps> Jackie, I think he's trying to do a Bible study with us. <laughs> and I looked, at, I looked at her. I said, well, Sheila, you call it whatever you want to. I said, I, think, I just think we need to read the Bible. Jackie, can we do a Bible study with the preacher for the Church of Christ? And uh, he looked at his wife and he said, oh, honey, I don't think it's ever wrong to study the Bible. And I said, okay. I said, what do you want to do? She said, well, I'll do this study with you, preacher. If it's a secret study, no one can know. I've never done a secret study in my life. I don't even know what that means. And I said, well, Sheila, I said, what does that mean? She says, well, that means that uh, you can't tell anybody because if you tell somebody that I'm doing a, a, a Bible study with the preacher for the church of Christ, they're excommunicate me. I said, excommunicate you? Now, there are a lot of things going on right now. That statement, excommunicate, is intriguing. Would y'all be intrigued by that statement? Would you say, well, that's interesting. I was tempted to ask, what does that mean? That's what the old Rob would have done. But the new Rob has seven principles he's operating under, and that violates principle seven. So I didn't. I let it go. I said, Sheila, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll agree. I won't tell anybody. I said, but um, I, do, I would like to talk to my elders and pray about it. She said, well, who are they? And I listed the, she said, well, you can tell. I know those guys. Just tell them not to tell anybody or they're excommunicating me. That's the second time she said it. We made our appointment and, man, I'm feeling pretty good. Brother, I got the Bible study. I got it. That's all I wanted. I just wanted a Bible study. I got it. I went home. Nicole said, I've never seen you more excited, Rob. She said, I mean, you are, you know, you're off the chart. I said, honey, that's what I wanted. I wanted a Bible and I got it. God answered my prayer. I said, that, 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 that is, you know, I called Chris Coy. I said, hey, Chris, I got, tell Scarlett, I got the Bible study with her mom and dad. I went to the church that Sunday, and I want to do something different at the church that I've never done before. I want to involve the church in my evangelism. I want it to be their evangelism. I don't want it to be the preacher. I want it to be them. So I want to set up a congregational model, and I really don't know how to do this. So there's one thing, though, I know I can get the church to do, and that's pray. I said, church, I cannot tell you who I'm studying with, but I can ask for your prayers, for them and for me and for Jonathan. 
And so I began the process of trying to create a congregational model. That's where it all started. Now, as, 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 as we pull into the driveway for our first study, we walk inside and uh, I said, Sheila, Jackie, I said, um, can we sit down around a the table? They said, sure. So we sat down around the table. I said, would it be okay if we open our Bibles? They said, yes. I said, I've got these little booklets. They're called Back to the Bible. Could we use those? Sure. And I'm about to begin. I said, well, Sheila, turn your Bibles to John 8. 30. She said, now you just wait a minute, preacher. She says, you know I'm saved. I said, well, I'm not here to, that's not my job. I said, Sheila, I'm not the judge. I, I, I'm here just to study the Bible. She said, well, I need to tell you all about my religious experience. And I said, okay. So I got my pen and paper out and I'm ready to write. She says, now, Rob, it was a dark and stormy night. Oh, no. I said, okay, okay, dark and stormy. And she said, Rob, I was driving along this road. The lightning was striking. The winds were blowing. The rain was falling. Rob, I could barely see. She says, and as we, uh, she says, Rob, she says, I- I'm telling you, Rob, as we went through th- th- this storm, I knew that, that it was getting worse. And I just, she said, Rob, I didn't know I was going to make it. She said, Rob, all of a sudden, the lightning struck the tree. The tree caught on fire, came over the road. At that point, I just closed my eyes because I knew I was going to die. And the Holy Spirit came down, took over the car, moved me out of the way, put me on a complete stop. And she looked at me. Do you know what she said? You don't believe me, do you? I knew you preachers in the church of Christ did not believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I just knew it. And uh, I looked at her. I said, Sheila, I'm not laughing. I'm writing down everything you said. Well, that's exactly what happened, Rob. And then I said, okay. And she said, no. And Jesus came down into my heart to be my personal Savior, and I was saved. And then, Rob, I went to church, and the, the pastor said, Sheila, you must testify. I testified. At the end of the testimonial, the church voted on me. It was unanimous. You have had the religious experience. You've been saved. Anything else, Sheila? Oh, yes, you'll want to know this. She said, six months later, we had a big baptism party, and I participated. I said, is there anything else you want to tell me? And she said, nope, that's exactly how it happened. I said, okay. (laughs) Wow, what a story, right? That's where I'm starting. You know, I do the same thing every time I meet people. I do the same thing. John 8, 32. I said, let's read our Bibles. Can we read our Bibles? She said, sure. So I just put that to the side. I never addressed it, not once. That's the old Rob versus the new Rob. The new Rob is not going to address that at all. He's going to leave it alone. And so I went to John 8, 32. She read the verse, and we started our Bible study, and they loved it. I mean, they're, they're, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Their faith is growing. You can see the excitement building. They're getting it. They're, you can tell by the questions they're asking. They, they're, they're, they're starting to see some differences. And, 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 and at the end of the study, Jackie Birdwell says, hey, Rob, it's my turn now. I said, okay. Jackie says, Rob, he says, I'm the deacon of the Oak Grove Church. I said, the deacon. I say, okay. I said, you must be a good servant. You wouldn't be a deacon if you weren't a servant. He said, Rob, I'm the treasurer of the Oak Grove Church. I said, you must be a good steward. You wouldn't be handling the money if you weren't trustworthy. He said, Rob, I'm the Bible class teacher of the Oak Grove Church. I said, you must be a person who loves the Bible because you wouldn't be teaching the Bible if you didn't love the Bible. (laughs) I'm not biting. I'm going to find something positive to say about everything he says. I will do my battle. I will do my... I'm going, to, I'm going to do my battle in God's word. I'm going, to, I'm going to take him to the Bible. I'm not going to allow any of these other things to distract me. And so, so he, he continues, and finally he said, Hell, Rob, he says, I do need to tell you something. He said, I, I, I learned something in this study that I didn't know. I said, what did you learn, Jackie? He said, I didn't know the difference between the Old and New Testament. He said, I feel shame. I've been teaching the Bible for 20, 30 years. I didn't know that. I said, Jackie, I said, would you like me to come back and maybe do another study? He said, sure. So I came back. We did study number two. So in study number two, we go through the church of Christ. We're going through the church. We're talking about worship and organization and name and and, uh, the headship. And it's going extremely well. During the study, Sheila looks over at Jackie and says, Jackie, why don't we take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week? He said, well, I don't know. I've never seen that verse before. (laughs) Pretty interesting. I'm just listening to them. And I can see they're really getting it. And as we walk through the study, Jackie and Sheila are coming on board, you know, and things are going well. And uh, we get to the end of the study. I said, hey, guys, what do you think? They said, we liked it. Jackie said, Rob, I learned a lot. I said, would you like to do another study? They said, yeah, we'd like you to come back. So sure enough, I come back for the third study. Now, in between, I call Scarlett, and here's why. I want to know what they believe. I I need to know more. 
So I called Scarlett. I said, Scarlett, why did you convert? Tell me more about the Oak Grove Church. And she starts telling me about her conversion experience. And I learned a lot in, 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 in her words. I mean, she really helped me. And one of the things she said is, Rob, when I told my mother and father that I, I made a decision to become a Christian, she guessed, I guess you can imagine it was pretty earth shattering. I said, I can imagine. How'd you do it? She said, I sat him down, explained. I showed him what I learned. And my mother just fell apart. She said, I can't believe you do this, Scarlett. She said, all your family goes to this church. Why would you leave us, Scarlett? And uh, mom, uh, let me show you. I don't want to see anything you've learned. And um, Scarlett, you know we're going to have to excommunicate you now. No. <laughs> I said, Scarlett, I, what in the world does that mean? And she says, well, Rob, that means the deacons are coming. The, the, the deacons, well, why are they coming? She said, well, they're going to bring the church roster. And she said, Rob, they came. And I got my Bible out. And my, all I wanted to do is, is show the deacons and my mother and father why I did what I did. So I had my Bible out. I'm ready. The deacons came in. They brought out the roster. They started reading the roster. They got down to, um, they got down to Scarlet Birdwell, and they brought out the big eraser, and they erased me. And they said, as though you have never been a member. <laughs> I said, well, that is very interesting. I said, did they pray about it? She said, no. I said, did they ask you a Bible question? She said, no. I said, did they even read the Bible? She said, no. I said, then they left. Then they walked out. And I said, Scarlett, what did your mom and dad think about this? She said, I've never seen my parents more infuriated that they didn't try to win me back. Well, brethren, after that, I, I, I pulled into the driveway, right? So I'm pulling into the driveway of their house for the, for the final study. And as I pull in, Jackie Birdwell tells me that he looked out the window and just dawned on him. He looked at his wife. He said, Sheila, that little preacher's pulling in our driveway. He thinks he's going to baptize us. He's got another thing coming, Sheila. He says, I've been in this church all these years, and I'm going to die here. And Sheila said, Jackie. She says, Mama goes here. Grandmama goes here. Aunt so-and-so goes here. She says, I'm going to die here, Jackie. <laughs> and uh, Jackie looked at his wife, and he said, I'm glad we got that covered. Never underestimate the power of the word of God, brother. Never do it. I, pull, I pulled into that. Uh, I walked in, you know, inside and we sat down. And, uh, and uh, we opened up the Bible. And we started our study. And uh, you, ought to, you ought to see the expression on their face as we, we walk through what God says about sin and salvation. And Jackie, his, he, he won't even look at me. Now we're in baptism. He won't even look at me. His eyes are tearing up a little bit. His hands are a little shaky. He, he puts his head down like this. He's got it. I know he's got it. And I looked at Jackie. I said, Jackie, I said, there's no need to go further. I think you got it. And this is what he said to me. He said, he said Rob, he says, uh, I get it. And I know what I've got to do. And he looked at his wife. He says, and we're going to do it. And I said, Jackie, I said, that's wonderful. And Sheila said, Jackie, you said we weren't going to do this. And she literally took her fist like this. And she hit him in the gut right there. And he, he goes, what was that for? And, and, uh, and she looked at him and said, you said we weren't changing churches. I'll never forget what, she said, what he said. Because he looked at his wife and he says, honey, we have no choice because it's what the Bible says. I could not believe what I was seeing. Chills literally ran up and down my spine. I said, we got to go and go right now, guys. Let's go. Go to the baptistry. And Jackie said, Rob, I can't do it tonight. I said, what do you mean you can't do it? Rob, I just can. He said, uh, he says, you, you don't understand. So I went into something called closing mode. And, and everybody, every preacher here has got, and, and, and every Christian has a, a sense of how do you close. You know, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, right? The same hour of the night. Um, life is a vapor. And I'm, I'm, I'm reading those, using those verses, but he won't budge. I mean, he won't move an inch. And I finally said, Jackie, I don't understand what you're waiting for. Jackie, why won't you obey the gospel tonight? You're lost. And this is what he said to me. He said, Rob, he says, you don't get it. He says, you don't get it. You grew up in the church, didn't you? And I said, I did. He said, you don't understand my position. He said, Rob, I will do it. But I hold the bag. I said, the bag? What's that? He said, Rob, all the money for this church is in this house. He said, I got to give it back. And then I'll do it. Do you know what that's called, by the way? Anybody? You know what that's called? It's called repentance. It doesn't take long for a 15-year-old boy to repent. It takes a lot longer for a 55-year-old man to do it. And I didn't get that. 
And all, all I could think about is he, there, you know, Satan is going to put a barrier here in between us and he's not going to do it. But then he said this. He said, Rob, you can come back to my house every day until I do it. And that's exactly what I did. Every day I went back. I brought my wife, my children. We, we introduced each other. They said, hey, kids, y'all can go pick strawberries. I had more strawberries than I knew what to do with. I mean, every day we'd swing on the porch. I'd look at Jackie. Jackie, is today the day? He said, not today, Rob, but it's coming. Wednesday night, Willette had about 200 members there on a Wednesday night. We, we have a really strong return rate in our, in our, in our the church. I'm, I'm standing in the back. And it's a fan-shaped auditorium. And I'm talking to Sister Jill. And as I'm talking to Sister Jill, she pops up and she looks and she sees Jackie and Sheila Bird will walk in. You ought to have seen the look on her face. <gasps> hey, hey, Rob. Hey, that's Jackie and Sheila Bird will, Rob. Why, I can't believe they're here. They're in the church. Wait a minute. Rob, is that that couple you've been studying with? I said it is. You've been studying? I mean, we've been praying for Jackie and Sheila Bird. I said, you have. Rob. And then she said these words. I can't believe it. Friend, they don't believe. Our brethren do not believe this works. They don't believe you can reach people. And because of that, we don't do it. On Wednesday night, Jackie and Sheila got up during the invitation and they walked forward. Brother, there wasn't a dry eye in that church. There were 200 people crying in that church. I could hardly take their confession. I had never been as moved in my life as I was that night. And I watched those two souls confess the name of Christ and we baptized them for the remission of their sins. If you ask me why I'm here at Heritage this morning, if you ask me why I'm doing this, why I'm traveling the country, I'll tell you, that's why. Because that conversion changed my life. That conversion changed the church at Willette. And I've never been the same. I took, my, I, took, I took that conversion and I said, you know, I learned some things here that I'm going to apply to the whole church. I'm going to teach everyone. And I started building it from that day forward. And so that's why I'm here this morning. And I'm going to give everybody a, a break here. And uh, we're going to try to take a break about every 45 minutes to an hour just to let you stretch and go to the bathroom. We come back. I want to tell you a little bit how that progressed because from that conversion we exploded. The, and we're in the middle of nowhere. The Willette Church of Christ is 45 minutes from a grocery store. Okay? No one moves to Willette. No one. All right? And so the only way that church grows is if we evangelize. And that's what we did. Now, on your table, those are, those are materials that have been donated to this school. Whether or not they're watching it virtually, I'm sure somehow, Travis, we can get those materials to your virtual students. Or whether you're here, there's about $400 worth of materials in that bag. And they've been donated to you. Because we're going to talk about some of those tools and how to use them. All right, a carpenter is not very good without tools, and neither is an evangelist. And so we got to talk a little bit about some of those tools as we walk through. Um, thank you for being here. So we'll take a quick break, and we'll come back. All right.
when you give me the green light, I'll, all right. Well, welcome everyone back to our uh, continuing uh, training on evangelism. And uh, I want to move forward. And uh, so we're going to talk about the results. So if you really want to energize a congregation, you got to start with one. Preachers call. They said, hey, Rob, how do we get this going? I said, just do it. I said, if you can just get one person evangelizing, you're going to, you're, you're going to, uh, you're going to have uh, residual effects. So we took that conversion, and, I, and I, I went to the elders, and I said, let's build on that. All right, so my immediate thought is, we need another one. Well, this is Jackie Birdwell within six months of that conversion. He's behind the pulpit. He's giving a Wednesday night invitation. The church is reminded continuously about this conversion. And so it's his son, Evan. So I immediately said, Jackie, I went to Jackie and Sheila. I said, Jackie and Sheila, your son Evan is not a Christian. They said, no. I said, well, I need to do a Bible study with Evan. Well, uh, Jackie looked at me and said, now, Rob, uh, he says, uh, Evan's a little different. Uh, I don't think it'll work. I said, well, Jackie, yeah, he, needs, he just needs a Bible study. I said, we're all different. I said, if we could just do a Bible study with Evan, I think he would convert like you did. He said, now, Rob, he said, Evan, a little backward. I said, Jackie, we live in uh, Macon County, Tennessee. We are all backwards out here. I said, we, uh, we just need a Bible study. He said, now, Rob, it won't work. Well, Sheila was listening. And she walks over to me. And she says, now, Rob, Jackie, you know our son needs a Bible study. Rob, get in there and do a Bible study with my son. Well, I chose to listen to Sheila. <laughs> and I went over there and I talked to, to Evan. I said, hey, Evan. I said, there's been some changes in your family. I said, your mom, your sister, your brother, and our, our, your, your brother-in-law and your dad. I said, uh, why don't we sit down and we'll, we'll study together? He looked at me and he says, I don't want to talk about it. And he was serious. And it, it just ended. So at that point, I went back to my office and I thought about it. I said, well, do I just give up on Evan? I said, no, I'm not going to give up on Evan. And so I, I started something called my target list. And it's something we encourage everyone to do. And we're going to get to it eventually. The target list is my personal list of people that I want to convert. I think everybody needs that list. Everybody needs a personal list of people they want to reach. So I put Evan top on my target list. I'm going to get to Evan. I'm relentless. I'm never going to give up. I don't care how many times he tells me no. I'm going to keep after him because I really believe I can get to Evan. So what happens? A um, little time passes by and I'm still trying to get to Evan you know and um, as this is uh, transpiring I'm doing new convert studies my wife and I with Jackie and Sheila um, and usually Sunday afternoons Evan will stop in he'll listen and he really liked my airplane stories he loved my airplane stories and so at that point um, uh, he um, uh, he uh, sit down and would listen and I said Evan I said uh, you like airplanes he said I love them he said man I I've always wanted to fly I said really I said, I'll take you for a flight tomorrow. You got a plane? I said, tomorrow, I'll take you for a flight, Lafayette. I said, I said, where would you like me to fly? He said, how about Salina Lake and Dale Hollow? I said, I'll fly you right around it. I said, it's a beautiful lake. When they dammed up the old uh, uh, area, there was a city down there and they flooded it. I said, you can see it in a clear day. He said, man, I can't wait to see that, Rob. I said, just meet me out at the airport. So we got out to the airport. We pre fly to the plane. I'm talking to him, you know. We're in the plane. We're taxiing down. We get to the end of the runway. We take off. I climb up to about 5,000 feet. Brother, you can baptize anybody at 5,000 feet. Let me tell you what. <laughs> you just roll it over. <laughs> no, I did not do that. I don't recommend that. But what I did do is I connected with heaven. And we flew around, and we're, we're, we're talking and things, and we land the airplane, and I look at him, and I need more time. I said, Evan, today's your day. He said, what do you mean? I'm taking you out to eat. It's my treat. Really? There's only a subway there. It's okay. Two for four. We went to subway. We had our, our, our lunch. I'm sitting across the table from him, and I got him right where I want him. And I said, hey, Evan. I said, um, would it be okay if I spent a few minutes and talked to you about Jesus? And he looked at me. He says, I don't want to talk about Jesus. <laughs> Man, I was blown away. I, I tell you, I was blown away. But before I could say another word, he, he looked at me and said, but Rob, he said, you know, when I'm ready to talk about Jesus, you'll be the first person that knows about it. Man, I took that. I love that. I said, that's great, Evan. You'll let me. He said, I'll let you know. I went back to the house. I told Nicole, I said, we are that much closer, you know, to that Bible study. We're closer now than we were yesterday. I don't know how close, but we're closer. And so we went to Bible camp just a few weeks later. And um, I'm at Bible camp. Now, my phone doesn't ring at Bible camp because for some reason in the brotherhood, there's not a Bible camp that has cell service. But it did that day. 
And I picked up my phone. Hello? Hey, Rob, this is Amy. Don't know who this is. Okay, yes. Hey, Rob, I think I'm going to hell. Can you do a Bible study with me? Brethren, you could live two lives and not have that conversation with somebody. And um, I don't know what to say. I'm completely taken off guard. I don't know who this is. And so I, I'm thinking, what do you say to that? And I said, okay, um, Amy, uh, why, why do you think you're going to hell? She says, well, she says, Scarlett Evans, this is Evans' sister, gave me this book, Muscle and a Shovel. Y'all ever hear that book, Muscle and a Shovel? Hey, by the way, guys, uh, um, you know that, that book, Muscle and a Shovel, is a great evangelism tool. It's a, it's, a, it's a good tool, and I want to talk about how to use it here in a little bit. Amy is Evan's girlfriend, and it snapped. This is his girlfriend. I said, I got it. So she's talking to me. I said, Amy, I said, um, I said uh, she says, Rob, I think I'm going to hell. Can you do a Bible study with me? I said, yes. I said, I'll do a Bible. I said, Nicole and I will do that study when we get home. She says, good. She said, Rob, I have one condition. I said, just name it. You got to do the study with Evan, too. I said, Amy, Evan doesn't want to do a Bible study. She says, I know, but that's your problem now. She told me that. And I said, I said, well, I said, uh, I said, wow, what am I going to... I said, Amy, do you know how Evan loves it when we do those new convert studies and with his mom and dad, but, but, but she cooks a big meal, Sunday meal. Evan loves his mama's cooking. I said, I need Sheila to make Evan's favorite meal. And I need Evan to know that. And I need him, I need him to know that we're going to do a Bible study with you. He'll stay, problem solved. And she says, I like it. I said, all right. So sure enough, on that Sunday, she made the spaghetti dinner. We had everything prepared. We're sitting around the table. And uh, Evan's there too. We finish eating. I grab my little booklet. I pass him out. I ignore Evan. I just ignore him, right? And uh, we start to study. I think Evan's going to stay. He looks at those booklets. He says, "Uh uh-uh. He says, "Uh -uh." uh-uh. He got up from the table. He walks out of the house. He gets in his car and he leaves. And that's it. And um, Amy falls apart. Amy literally just boo-hoo. She just cries. She just, she just, everything just, uh, just collapses right there. And um, Sheila is really upset. That's his mother. She's in the kitchen. I can't believe my son was so disrespectful to the preacher. And I mean, it really is not good. And I looked at Amy. I said, Amy, Nicole's holding her. She's really crying. I said, hey, Amy. I said, don't you think we still need to do this Bible study together? Yes, Mr. Rob. I said, okay, let's open our Bibles and get started. So we just started right there. We're starting John 8, 32. We're going through the study. We're on page one. Evan pulls back in. Evan gets out of his car. Evan walks in the house. Evan sits down right in front of me. Amy, she, her old demeanor changes, right? And she said, hey, Evan, you'll need these booklets. And he says, I don't want the booklets. And, then, and, then, and I said, well, Evan, would you like a Bible? I don't want the Bible. I just want to listen. And he did. By the end of the study, he's answering all the questions. And he's very intelligent. And um, after that, uh, Nicole looked at me and she looked at her, her, his mom and dad. And he says, I think Evan and Amy would do better at our house. Just, just us. And they said, yes, we think so too. So Nicole fixed a big meal. And um, they came over. Hannah made one of her desserts. We just ate and relaxed. I brought out the booklets. He took the booklet, the Bible, and we do the study. And he loved it. I mean, we're on the way to the cross. It's another one. We're on the way. Satan doesn't give them up easily, brethren. And he's going to do an all-out assault on this couple. An all-out assault. And I'm going to tell you more about it later on. From that conversion, I want to show you what happened. We just, we just started. I started with my neighbor, Ed Goolsby. The elders, when I moved in, said, Rob, leave Ed Goolsby alone. We made an agreement with Ed. We won't bother him. He won't bother us. Rob, don't bother Ed Goolsby. I'm glad my dog didn't know. And... Um, and so uh, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you the whole, I'll tell you. So uh, I'm walking back from my house and to the parsonage. And I have a dog and her name is Rue. And when we moved in, uh, we have a lot of acreage behind the house. And I, Rue's going to get hurt. She's going to get, she's going to get run over by a car. So I, I bought what's called the invisible fence. Y'all know what the invisible fence is? And you put that, you know, so I bought it. But the direction says it takes two weeks to train dog. I got two minutes. I just turned it on to maximum power. She'll learn. And I put the collar on her, and I went to work. I come back, Rue sees a deer on the back of the yard. She takes off. She violates the fence. It lays her out. She's zzz, 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 like this. and I mean, she is yelping as hard as the dark could yelp. My, my children say, Dad, Dad, 
dead. You're going to kill the dog. They're running after the dog. If they touch the dog, they're going to get electrocuted. So I'm yelling at the kids, don't touch the dog. Don't touch the dog. Nicole's, you know, and it stops. It only does it for so long. The dog runs under the house of Ed Goolsby. And she's yelping as loud as a dog can yell. I said, kids, come with dad. You know? So I go over to the house, and this is grumpy Ed. I'm not supposed to talk to him. I knock on his door. He opens the door. Yes, can I help you? I said, yes, sir, my name is Rob. I'm your name. I know who you are. I said, I, just, I know you did. And uh, I said, sir, I need to get my dog under your house. Would that be okay? Did you shoot your dog? I said, no, sir, I'd never shoot my dog. He says, well, go get your dog. And so I said, children, go get the dog. And so they're going under the house to get the dog, and what an excellent evangelistic opportunity I have. I said, Ed, I said, I'm the new preacher here at Willette. I'd like to introduce myself formally. And as I did that, Ed looked at me and says, I already know who you are. He took the door and he slammed it so hard it about came out of the frame. I mean, not a great first impression. Um, about six months later, we're going to do a little door knocking. And, uh, and uh, I looked at uh, one of our new converts. And his name's James and his, his, his wife and uh, Glinda. And James and Glinda, I said, hey, James and Glinda, when you pass out house to house, can you go pass out to, to, to start with uh, Ed, and I'll go down the other way. And they said, Rob, well, wh- wh- why are you sending us to Ed? And I said, well, James, you, you're, you work together at the volunteer fire department. You know Ed. I said, yeah. I said, he don't want to see me. And so, so I went the other way. He goes to Ed's house. He knocks on his door. And they called me. And they said, hey, Rob, Ed wants to see you right now. I said, oh. So I walk back up and I go to the house. Ed's outside in this chair. Tears are dropping out of his eyes. It's amazing what six months does. I said, Ed, are you okay? He says, no, I'm not. Hey, Rob, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that to you. He said, Rob, I got back from my doctor a few days ago and I got cancer, Rob. Rob, I don't know Jesus. I said, would you like to know Jesus, Ed? He says, I would. I said, I just so happen to have these little booklets, and we could do this Bible study together. And that's right after the baptism. Brethren, it grew, and it really grew. This right here is Charles and Mary Hunt. I didn't do those. This, is, this, this right here with two of our ladies. They, they again, take, they took house to house, heart to heart. They're going door to door, just like we taught them to do it. And, uh, and Melanie and uh, Betty McCarter. Now, I'll tell you about how this happened. This is on a holler. So in Middle Tennessee, you got hollers, and these are big hollers. On top of the holler here is Charles and Mary Hunt. He's the city manager of Carthage. And as they're, wa- as they're walking along and they see this house, he's got ferocious dogs. They're chained up, and they're barking ferociously. And uh, Betty McCarter looks over at Melanie, and she says, uh, Melanie says, Betty, remember this morning Rob said it's okay to observe the Passover still? We'll pass over this one. It's okay. And he said, we're not going there. And she says, oh, no, this could be the one. And they had this argument, and they walked up the hill. Charles peeps through the window, and he sees him come. He says, Mary, the Jehovah Witnesses are coming back. Mary, get ready. I'm going to get them this time. And so as, as she's knocking on the door, he opens it up, and he's ready to just tear into her. She's holding house to house, heart to heart. And he sees it. He says, hey, Mary, house to house, heart to heart is here. We read this magazine every week. Y'all come on in. And so Betty and Melanie don't know what to do. They they went in. And so you sit down. He says, well, what what do you want to tell us? And she said, now, what was it that Rob said? Yes, number one. um, um, Would you like to know more about the church of Christ? He says, sure we would. And she says, "Uh, oh, no. Um, And um, and then she, what was this? Oh, yes. When would you like to know? Oh, right now we'd be fine. Oh, no. Um, third question, where would you like to do this? All right, here, here, your church. We'll go. She says, can you excuse me? She steps out of the house. She calls me. This is what she said. Uh, hey, Betty, Rob, we've got a hot one here, and we don't know what to do. She, a hot one? What, what do you mean? Rob, they're ready now. I said, well, I said, do a Bible study. She said, Rob, they're, they said they'd come to the church building. I said, bring them to the church building. The whole family, there's three of them. They all go to the church building, and I'm sitting there. I had never met him before, and I brought out the tool, doesn't matter. And I'm going to do what I call the one study method with him, because I, I didn't know if I'd ever see him again. I went through the method with him. At the end of the study, Mary, this is Miss Mary, she pierces her lips, she makes a fist, and she goes, oh, and she hits the table, she pushes on the table, and she literally rolls 10 foot back from the table to the edge of the wall. 
Charles, where's Mary going? He says, I, I don't know, Rob. Charles, she's upset. He says, well, let me find out why. So he walks over to his wife. And I'm sitting there with their son, and um, I'm waiting. We're talking. They come back, and they sit down. Uh, Rob, Mary's upset. I said, well, I could observe that. And I said, Mary, why are you upset? She says, I want to know why I've gone to this church over here on the hill all my life. They never told me I had to be baptized. It's right here in the Bible. It says, he that believes and is baptized. Why didn't they tell me that? I said, I don't know. I said, Mary, I don't know. I said, but I know I can fix it. And we took him and we baptized him. By the way, there's a lesson in this for everyone here. Everyone responds differently to the truth. Some get mad, some laugh, some cry. The most dangerous ones are the ones that get quiet. Because I can't read them. I don't know what they're thinking. The ones that say nothing, that show no emotion at all, to me are the most difficult people to reach. I don't know where they're at. I'd rather you yell at me. I'd rather you cry. I'd rather you do something. But when you look at me and you don't even blink an eye, I know we've got a problem. Let's go to the next one. We just built. Remember, we started, the church at Willett started at 220. We went to 230, to 240, to 250, to 260, to 270, to 280, to 290, to 300, and we just kept growing. And no one moves to Willett. The only way we grow is do this right here. And the whole church is now on board. It's a, it was the most exciting part of my ministry. Everybody's on board. Everybody believes. They're bringing me names. But I had a guy sitting in the pews, and his name's Ronnie Rhodes. And Ronnie, he just, he's not a Christian. And so I went to the eldership. I said, hey, guys, I said, has anybody ever done a Bible study with Ronnie Rhodes? And said, oh, no. I said, I'm going to do a Bible study with Ronnie Rhodes. One of the elders looked at me and said, oh, Rob, please don't. I said, well, why? You run him off. He won't come back. I looked at that elder and I said, brother, I love you, but you don't get more lost than lost. I said, we, we're doing no harm to have a Bible study with Ronnie Rhodes. And I said, I said I'm going to do it. So I, I made a critical error. Bobby Bates, great soul winner of the 1970s, great in the 1980s. And um, he wrote a book. And um, in that book, he, he'd written something that I did not know. And it says this, never ask the believing spouse If you can do a Bible study with the unbelieving mate, never ask them. And he says, because they're always say no. They always say no because they want to protect what they've got. They don't want to cause friction. They don't want to upset the apple cart. Don't don't ever ask them. Just do it. Well, I made the mistake and I asked. I went to his wife and I said, hey, uh, hey, Marilyn. I said, I'm thinking about maybe doing a Bible study with you. And she teared up almost immediately on me. I said, what did I just do? And she said, Rob, please don't do that. He, at least he comes with me. If you do that, he won't come. And I could tell, I can't talk to her about this. I could tell because tears are now coming out of her eyes. And I said, uh, Marilyn, I said, I, I, won't, I won't do it. I respect what you just said. And uh, I felt terrible because I know he's not going to become a Christian if we don't do a Bible study. So I, had to, so I waited a year. And after a year, he's got to have surgery. That's my opening. I went over to his house, and I said, hey, Ron, I'm just going to come and pray with you. So I came and prayed, and he's showing me his, he's a, he's a carpenter. He, man, he's a really good carpenter. And uh, he's showing me all this stuff, and he's recovering from this surgery. And, and I said, Ronnie, I said, how many years have you been going out to Will Ed? He said, oh, about probably 25, 30 years. And I said, Ronnie, tell me about your family. Every member of his family is a denominational preacher, <laughs> every one of them. And I said, oh, I said, Okay. And I said, Ronnie, how much do you really know about the will at Church of Christ? He said, well, just what I hear, you know, on Sundays. I said, well, i got some things I'd like to talk to you about and get your feedback. I said, would you be interested? He said, well, sure. I, I said, I, t- I tell you, my wife is the best cook in Macon County. I said, we'll have you over to the house, have a dinner, and we'll just talk. He said, ah, okay, that'd be, that sounds good. I got my Bible study. They came over to the house. I called Marilyn. She's excited. Marilyn and him came over. We had dinner. I pulled out my back to the Bible. I said, Ronnie, I'd like to do this back to the Bible study with you, if it's okay. He said, sure. So we opened up our Bibles, and we baptized him. And we just keep going. And I wish I, 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 for time's sake, I can't tell you all the details of every study, but I'm learning. Every study I do, I'm learning something. I learned from this one. And I'm including these studies because these were pivotal in, my devel- in our development at Willette. This is Jerry Conley. So when I got to the Jacksonville Church of Christ, when Alan started this school, he said, hey, Rob, he says, I believe in what you're doing. The elders believe in what you're doing. The church doesn't. 
you have to convince the church. So I asked Alan, I said, make me a list of everyone in this church that's, that's not a Christian that comes. Make me a list. He made me a list of about 20 people. They come on and off, but they're not Christians. I said, okay, let's start with number one. Number one was Jerry Conley. I said, all right, Alan. I said, um, take me to the house of Jerry Conley. And he does. He, we, we, we were a 20-minute drive. I got in his van one, one morning. We pulled out. He knocks on the door. Jerry opens it up. Alan, what's going on? Shook hands. Alan said, hey, we got a new member here. His name's Rob Whitaker. He moved up here, down here from Tennessee. Well, Rob Whitaker from Tennessee. Where are you from, Rob Whitaker, from Tennessee? I said, well, I grew up in Texas, in Tennessee, uh, north of Nashville. And, uh, hmm, what do you know about the state of Alabama? I said, not a lot. Well, let me tell you about Alabama. I got the complete history lesson of Alabama. I mean, he told me everything there was to know about Alabama. And he, he said, Rob, up here in the hills was the old iron ore mine. Did you know the capital of Alabama was going to be right here? Not in Birmingham because we had the iron ore mine here for the war effort. I mean, I got the complete history. He said, this house right here, Rob, he said, this used to be the old house of the owner of that ore mine. And he's given me a complete tour of the house. This is the original molding. This is the original doorknob. We went for hours. At the end of the, the tour, I looked at him and I said, hey, Jerry Conley. I said, my, my little wife is from Tennessee. Never been, this is her first time to Alabama. She don't know anything about Alabama. Could I bring her over here? Would you give her a history? Well, oh, I'd be love to do that. I have one mission. There's this one thing I want and I'm going to get it. He's on my target list. I brought my wife back next week. He opens up the door. Hey, Rob. I said, this is my wife, Nicole. Nicole, up here in the old iron ore mine. We did it again. We went through the entire process. And as we're walking through the house, Jerry, I smelled something. I said, Jerry, what does what that smell? He said, that's apple pie, Rob. He said, Miss Alice Sue's made you an apple pie. I said, well, wonderful. Let's get in the kitchen and have apple pie. So we sat around and we're talking now. I got him right where I want him. I said, Jerry Conley, how much do you know about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? He said, really not a lot. When Ella Sue and I married, I just started coming with her. Both our spouses died, Rob. And I said, I know, I'm so sorry. We were sweethearts, you know, in school. Now we've been reunited. I said, uh, Jerry, do you like the Jacksonville Church of Christ? These are questions I always ask. I'm going to have you write these down later. Don't do it now. But these are my transition questions. I always ask the same questions. And, and he said, yeah, you know, I like that church real nice. I said, would you like to know more about us? He said, you know, I kind of would. I said, well, I just so happen to have these little booklets. I brought them out. I said, could we open our Bibles and just maybe, oh, yeah, sure. You know what happens when you do Bible studies? We baptized 17 people in just over a year doing that at Jacksonville. And um, they believe now. There he is after the baptism, and that's, uh, that's his wife, Ella Sue. And um, every time I see him, he hugs my neck. And uh, you know what he told me after the study? I didn't know, Rob. No one ever studied with me. I hear that pretty frequently. I didn't know. No one ever studied with me. How many people out there right now are not Christians because no one's ever studied with them? They really just don't know. They've never had a Bible study in their life. Let me tell you about this young man. When I grew up, I grew up in South Texas, uh, in, in just north of San Antonio, and uh, my dad worked for Delta Airlines, and he bought a little ranch. He doesn't want to raise us in the city. He said, I want to raise you, my family in the country, and I was bored. And so um, I asked my mom, I said, Mom, I want a friend. She said, well, go, 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 go make one. Well, I knew this little, this boy was on my bus route, so I walked down to his house, knocked on his door. I said, hey, would you be my friend? He said, sure. His name was Mel. And we grew up riding horses, shooting and fishing. And I mean, we had a, just, just a really, really good time growing up. And, um, but I noticed something about Mel that was very different than me. And what I noticed is that Mel um, has a very different religion than I do. He has crosses all over the house. He has pictures of Mary everywhere. He's, uh, he's, uh, he goes to Mass. He's always going to church on Saturday. He goes to church on Monday, too. He's an altar boy. I didn't understand any of those things. So I went to my dad. And I said, hey, Dad, what, what, what does all this mean? And he says, oh, uh, uh, he's, he's a Catholic, Rob. And I said, well, I said, well, why isn't he a Christian? And my dad said, well, you'd have to teach him. Now, I, I was just in middle school. And it started about eighth grade. And in eighth grade, I started teaching Mel Hutzler about Jesus. And I don't really know how to do it. So I'm really paying close attention to our preacher, Daryl Conley. And I'm, I'm learning as much as I can, you know, as, as he's preaching. I pick up things that were different, like, um, 
like a Mel, Mel, I, Mel they, bapt, they sprinkle babies. Well, I, I picked up that Ethiopian eunuch. I said, now that's different, right? So I, I, we, we'd read that, Acts 8. I said, Mel, can you explain to me why y'all sprinkle? I was just curious. He said, yeah, I'll find it in the Bible. And every now and then, I, hey, Mel, have you found it yet? Yeah, it's in there somewhere. And I said, Mel, he said, I'll ask my priest. It's not in there. It's nowhere in there. And so, so we just kept doing this over and over again. Then I started taking Mel to meetings, gospel meetings. He could come with me. And I remember hearing a, a preacher by the name of um, uh, John Shannon. He's the baker in Memphis. Uh, Kirk, you know the old sheet sermons that John Shannon does? He had, this is right after he became a Christian. You know, he, he, he became a Christian from Catholicism. And he has a sheet sermon, Why I Left the Catholic Church. He was doing this at the Shenandoah Lectureship. I still, I still, I, we went and Mel listened. We got back home and we talked about it for weeks. And he started to bother him. Now we're seniors in high school. And he is really digging into the Bible. And he is searching for his church. He's searching. And, and I, I kept studying. And I don't, again, I'm, I, I'm just 18 years old. I really don't know how to do this. Mel walks into my room one day and I could tell something was on his mind. I said, Mel, what's wrong? He says, uh, Every time we study the Bible, everything you believe is in the Bible. Nothing I believe is in the Bible. I can't even find my church in the Bible. I want to be a Christian, Rob. Boy, that was a good day. Man, I, 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 that sent chill bumps up and down me. And um, I said, man, Mel, I said, that's great. I said, I'm so proud of you. I said, I said I, what do you want to do? He said, well, I've got one problem. He says, you know my dad? And I do know his dad. I'm scared to death of him. He uses four-letter words during most conversations. He yells, he screams, he's violent. I don't, I don't like to be around him at all. And uh, I said, yeah. I said, Rob, I need your help to explain this to my dad. I said, okay. I said, let's go talk to your dad. So I got in the car. We went over to the house. We sit down. He says, hey, dad, Rob and I want to talk to you about something. Sure, what do you want? Religion. Oh, yeah. His dad went to priest. Good school. He didn't become a priest, but he went to school. His dad's educated. So he brings out his Catholic Bible. He's God. He said, what do you want to know, Rob? And I said, well, Mr. Hutzler, Mel and I have been doing a lot of Bible study, and I, was, I asked him a question. Why do y'all sprinkle babies? And he says, well, that's a good question. I said, can we read Acts 8, 35 through 39, the Ethiopian eunuch? And I read it. I said, Mr. Hutzler, why in the New Testament that they immerse believers and in the Catholic Church, they, they sprinkle babies? He said, I don't have to answer that. He became very defensive. I said, no, sir, you don't. He says, yeah, you do, Dad. I want to know. He said, I want to know why we believe that. And him and his dad started going back and forth. It wasn't pretty. And it got, it got really ugly really fast. And uh, they're very, it's very contentious. And his dad, and he starts asking his dad more questions. His dad has no answers because there are no answers. And, uh, and finally, his dad said, that's enough of this. And he looked at me. He pointed right at me. He says, get out of this house. He said, you're the cause of all of this. And he brought his wallet out of the back side of his pants pocket. He threw it at me like a Nolan Ryan fastball. It barely missed. He says, I told you, get out of this house. I never want to see you again. You're never to talk to my son again. I better never see you drive past this home again. He said, get out of this house. And... Uh, his, his dad's violent, and his dad came at me. Mel is a big guy. He's very strong. And uh, Mel stepped in front of his dad, and he said, not today, Dad. And his dad is pushing on Mel, and Mel's holding his ground. And he turned over his shoulder, and he looked at me, and he says, Rob, he says, uh, you got to leave. My dad and I need to talk. And uh, I was shivering. I've never been so scared in my life. I thought he was going to hurt me. I, I walked out of the house and I ran, I ran home. I'm 18 years old and uh, I'm not ashamed to say it. I crawled into the arms of my mother and I cried. I have never seen a person act like that in my life. I didn't understand it. I was respectful as I could be. He was mad. Nine o'clock that night, my doorbell rings. And uh, my dad and I go to the door and we open it. And Mel Hutzler has two suitcases in his hand. And um, he says, Mr. Whitaker, my dad said if I remain a Catholic, I could stay at home. But if I, if I choose to become a Christian, I have to leave. Uh, I choose to be, become a Christian, Mr. Whitaker, and I have no place to live. I never forget my mother. She, she, she broke through. My dad and I, she hugged him as tight as she could. And she says, son, you always have a place to live in this house. This house is your house. And that was it. Mel moved in. He literally moved in. She got, he got the extra bedroom. And um, 
I'm waiting for him to obey the gospel. He does not obey the gospel. We're weeks into this. And I didn't understand. I said, Mel, what's going on? My dad sat down with him. And he says, uh, Mel, we get it. You're having to make a choice that no human being on earth should have to choose. He says, is there any way you can go meet with your dad and make peace? And Mel said, I'll try. So he went over to the house with his dad. They sat down. His dad said, okay, you want to be a Christian, so be it. But you got to do a Bible study with a monsignor. If you do a Bible study with a monsignor and you choose to be a Christian, you can come back home, but you got to complete the study. And I, Mel comes back and tells me this. And I said, well, Mel, what's a monsignor? I, I didn't even know what that was. He said, that's one level up from a Catholic priest. I said, oh. I said, we're going to convert their whole church. I see it now. And I mean, I, I was excited. I thought this was an opportunity to convert a lot of people. And, uh, but Mel told me something. My dad said, you can't go, Rob. I said, what do you mean I can't go? He said, you're not allowed to go. I have to do this alone. So every day, Mel and I got ready for the study. We got our preacher, Daryl Connolly. He's teaching Mel. Where he's, he's preparing him for this Bible study. Mel, on the day of the study, goes to the cathedral the Monsignor is there, and there's Mel and the Monsignor at the desk. Mel opens his Bible. He says, Mr. Monsignor, I have one question. He said, what is it, Mel? I want to know why we sprinkle in the Bible the immerse. And he reads the verse. And the Monsignor says, you don't have to read that verse to me. Mel said, I do. So he keeps reading. Son, I told you to stop reading that verse. But Mr. Monsignor, I need to read this verse. Son, we're not here to do this. And he literally took the Bible out of Mel's hands, and he puts it in on the desk, and he closes it. And he says, son, we're not here to study that book. We're here to talk about Catholic tradition. And by the way, we don't just go by the Bible. We go by, by, by the Bible and tradition, and it's my job to explain it to you. Mel picked up his Bible. He looked at the Monsignor. He said, as far as I'm concerned, this Bible study is over. And he left. He's walked out. On Sunday morning at the Northern Oaks Church of Christ in San Antonio, Texas, Mel Huxler walked forward. And he was baptized. And uh, that's why I became a gospel preacher. I had already went to flight school. I was on my way to become a, a pilot. I had my license. And I went home that day and I looked at my mother. I said, Mom, I don't want to be a pilot. And she about dropped dishes. She said, Gary, Gary, come out here. Your son's got something to say. I said, Dad, I, I love airplanes, Dad. I said, but I think I can take people higher with the gospel than I can an airplane. And I said, I'm going to be a gospel preacher. Mel and I went to school together. I waited a whole year because he wasn't ready. And I held back and I went to the Southwest School of Bible Studies in Austin, Texas, and that's where we graduated. Fifteen years ago, the church at Northern Oaks called me and they said, hey, Rob, would you be our preacher? And I said, I cannot. I said, but I know who will. And they hired Mel Hutzler where he was baptized. That picture was taken about three years ago when he was appointed one of their elders. This is what Jesus said. I say unto you, lift up your eyes. Look on the field. They are white unto harvest. Brethren, they're white unto harvest in Tanzania, and we're sending people. They're white unto harvest in Honduras. They're white unto harvest in, in uh, Costa Rica. They're white unto harvest in, in, in Honduras. They're white unto harvest in India. They're white unto harvest in, in Jamaica. Are they not wide into harvest in Florence, Alabama? Are there people not in our area that we can reach with the gospel of Christ? And the, the answer is, there is. And if we don't start looking in our area and spend resources at home and focus on the people that we work with, that we go to school with, we focus on our families, our, our, our friends, our co-workers, the people we shop with, the people we play ball with, the people that live in our communities, our churches aren't going to survive. That verse applies in every continent. That verse applies in every country. And that's why we're here today. Brother, if you'll spool up the second lesson for me, um, we'll continue our, our training this, this, uh, this morning. What I want to do now that I've set the stage is I want to break out for you those seven principles. I want to teach you the seven things that we do in our school, the things that I learned as uh, we've developed our evangelistic uh, um, uh, approach. The title of the lesson is called Stay With the Message, and I always start with this book. Because if we don't start here, there's no reason to go any further. 
Because this is the tool. This is the, the focal point. This is the power to save. And um, we, never, we never need to forget that all evangelism starts with this book and it ends with this book. And there is no magic bullet. There's, there's no special formula. There is no wand that can be waved to create evangelism in a church. This is the evangelism model that we must follow. In 2016, one of our Christian universities did a survey, and what they wanted to do is find out what we look like, and I want to share with you the results. And so they went to their science department. They said, let's commission the study. I want it to be scientific. I want it to only be members of the Church of Christ, and, and it came back. In 19, uh, excuse me, 2016, they discovered that uh, 60% of our church members are over the age of 50. They discovered that only 13% of our church members are under the age of 30. Brethren, we're a gray-headed church. I want you to think about where you attend. The average church, and you may not be at the average church. But I can tell you the average church that I, I do these seminars is, is, is represented pretty well right here. Every now and then I, I have one that kind of tilts the model. But by and large, this is... And in fact, I go to some churches where I'm the youngest member. And there's a hundred people in the auditorium. And I, I'm, I'm, in my, I'm in my late 40s and I'm one of the youngest people there. And so if you were a president of a nation and your interior secretary walked in, he said, Mr. President, Mr. President, 60% of our citizenry is over the age of 50, two-thirds of our population. Only 13% of our citizenry is under the age of 30. You have a national crisis. In fact, may I propose that if you were a sovereign nation, that your nation's dying. You won't make it. In fact, the only way to fix this, according to sociologists, studies I've seen, um, population replacement. That's the only way to fix it. Because there's no way you can reverse this at this point. Thank God I'm not talking about the United States of America. Thank God, brothers, I'm not talking about the President of the United States. I'm talking about the King of King and Lord of Lords. I'm talking about the Church of Christ. And I can tell you that God has the ability and the power to change these numbers. But he won't do it without you. And if there's one thing we learn in the Old Testament is that if you don't fight for God, he won't fight for you. And if you sit in your tabernacle, if you sit there in your city and you think God's going to protect you from Babylon, he's not going to do it. If you don't do what God says, he'll let you die. I don't care if you have the Ark of the Covenant or not. You're not going to make it. Brethren, he will let us die. Our church buildings aren't going to save us. Our programs aren't going to save us. The great works of the past are not going to save us. If we don't evangelize, we're going to fossilize. If we don't take this and understand that this is what we look like now, we have to address it. It's got to be addressed head on. And that's what we're going to do. I was sitting in behind the lectern getting ready for my, my Bible class. A man walks in. I've never seen him before. His wife is with him. He makes a beeline. He comes at me. He gets right to the lectern. He said, uh, sir, he says, uh, you're the preacher here. And I said, yes, sir. My name's Rob Whitaker. And uh, he said, my name's Richard Pratt. This is my wife, Daisy. I said, well, Mr. Pratt, nice to meet you, Miss Daisy. Sir, I got a question for you. I said, well, ask. He says, I want to know, does this church just preach the Bible? I said, wait, sir, that's all we preach. And he says, well, good. The church I left last week stopped doing it years ago. And I said, well, I said, uh, welcome to Willette. And I said, we're glad you're here. And people started coming up, you know, very friendly as they should. I, he sat right behind my wife and my daughter and son. And uh, we go through the service together. Everything's going well. At the end of service, it's my turn. I'm not letting him out. I walked up to him and said, uh, I said, uh, Richard, uh, Daisy, I said, we have a little custom here at Willette. And they said, what is it? I said, we always take visitors out to eat. I said, I'd like to know. I said, uh, would you guys like to go get a bite to eat? And they said, yeah, preacher, we will. Yeah, we'd love to go get a bite to eat. Rather than when a steak costs $30, who's going to turn down a free meal? I mean, you know. So we went, we, we went out to eat, sat around the table. We're sitting there talking. And I'm going to ask my introductory questions. Now, if you guys have a, a notepad, if you don't, 
um, in your bag, there is a notepad. And I want you to write down three questions for me because these are my introductory questions. I always ask them, and, they're, and, and, and if you can talk, you're qualified to ask them. They take no educational background. They take no graduate work. They just take being a human being. All right, that's your only qualification. Are you human? You ready? Question number one. Where are you from? Can we all ask that question? Where are you from? And uh, there's a book written not long ago and, and, and uh, got a lot of play. And um, basically the crux of the book is this. Everyone has a story to tell. Everybody in this room has a story to tell. And do you know if I ask the right questions, you'll tell me your story? Everybody in this room, all I got to do is ask the right question. Well, there's three questions I can ask that normally get people to tell me their story. I want them to tell me everything there is to know about them. Bobby Bates used to say it like this. If you want to quote Bobby Bates, if I show you interest, you'll give me information. That was his quote. I like it because it's very accurate. So if you're going to be an effective evangelist, what must you do? you got to show interest in people. You can't talk about yourself. So I, I know this sounds methodical. I, I realize that sounds robotic, but I have to be like this or I won't do it. All right. So I make it very casual, though. I'll say, hey, Richard, uh, where are you from? I'm from Vermont. I said, Vermont? You're way down here. To... Richard, <laughs> what's in Vermont? He said, now, Rob, that's the dairy state. That's the cheese state. I said, yes, it is. What's a, he said, well, there's logging up there. And he said, I'm a logger. And he gives me his whole life story about his arrests, about things he's been in trouble doing, about how he's turned his life around, and Daisy and him got married at a young age, and Daisy stuck with him. He's overcome alcoholism. He's, over, he's been clean for a long time. He just had to get away from those friends. And he's, got, he's, he's come down to Middle Tennessee because we've got the largest standing of hardwood anywhere in the world, and we do in Middle Tennessee. And he said, I'm, I'm an independent logger, Rob, and I, I sell the timber to one of your, well, one of your elders, Hugh Wayne Clark, who has the largest lumber company in the state of Tennessee. He's a good man. I said, so we did this conversation, this continues. I never got past introductory question one, which is perfect. It's what I wanted. Well, Rob, aren't you going to ask for a Bible study? No, I am not going to ask for a Bible study. Brother, let me just pause just for a minute. All right. Rule number one, I don't ask for Bible studies. If you want a Bible study, don't ask. I'll explain that later. But if you want a Bible study, you should not ask for the study. They're going to ask you. All you've got to do, all you've got to do is show interest in people. I promise you, they're going to bring it up. You don't have to bring it up. And so we're going to come back to that statement. But I hear, you know, sometimes, well, just ask your neighbor for a Bible study. I'm saying, do what? I said, if you go ask someone, hey, would you like to have a Bible study? What are they going to do? <laughs> They're going to run for the hills. He said, you're a fanatic. Why would I want to do a Bible? Oh, I know just as much about the Bible as you do. I mean, there is very few positive things that happen from that question. It's like rolling the dice and just hoping you get the lucky one. Um, it's not going to happen. All right, now, back to this. So um, we're sitting there talking. I said, Richard, uh, you came to the Church of Christ this morning because you wanted to know more about the Bible. He says, I do. I said, how much do you know about the will at Church of Christ? He says, not a lot. I said, so would you like to know more? He says, I would. Now he's asking me. Notice how I turned that whole thing around. I said, so you want to know more about the Bible? He says, I do. I just so happen to have these little booklets. I said, they're called Back to the Bible. I said, why don't we sit down around? He said, well, well preacher, we'd love to. We got all afternoon. I said, good. So we went back to the, we went back, uh, uh, to the, uh, to the office. Uh, Nicole and I and Richard and Daisy gathered around the table, and we did book number one. He loved it. I mean, he's energized. He is, he is all in. He said, Daisy. I didn't know we weren't under the Old Testament. I didn't know we weren't under the Ten Commandments. This is really good stuff. I mean, they're soaking it in. By the end of the study, Richard grabs his pen. He looks at me. He said, hey, preacher. He says, I'm sold. Where's the paperwork? The, the paper, the paper for what? He said, to join your church. He says, where's the paperwork? I said, well, Richard, there's really no paperwork involved here. I said, what you need to do is uh, you need to... Um, uh, you need to do a Bible study. Preacher, we've already done the Bible study. He said, he said, I just need, don't you know when you've made a sale, 
He said, just show me the paperwork and I'll sign the papers. And I said, well, Richard, you really need to do another. St- There's a few more things you need to learn. He said, well, if you think so. I said, I do. He said, we'll come back. I said, next week, come to our house. We'll fix dinner. We'll eat together. And then we'll have a study. He said, well, that sounds good. So sure enough, next week, they came back. We went through the second study. Again, they're overwhelmed. They've never done a study. I didn't know the Church of Christ was in the Bible. I didn't know you're supposed to take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Richard, did you know elders were supposed to be married and have... Our elders weren't married. I mean, he's learning. He gets it. And uh, at the end of the study, he again gets out his pen. He says, preacher, he says, I got it. How much money do you need? Money? For, For what? He said, preacher, how much money do you need to join your church? I looked at him. I said, I need all of it. No, I did not say that. I did not say that at all. And uh, I said, no, Richard. I said, there's no money taken here. I said, we just need to do another Bible study. Shoo. He said, Daisy, at the last church, if we missed a giving, they'd send us a bill. A bill. I said, what kind of bill? He said, a tithing bill. We'd, they'd mail it to us. We'd mail our tithe. I said, okay. I said, Richard, we just need to do another study. Another study? Preacher, are you thinking I'm that bad of a sinner that I need a third Bible study? I said, well, Richard, it's really not about your sins, but it is. I said, um, <laughs> we just need to do another study. He said, okay, preacher. So he went off, and he, <laughs> he doesn't understand. And uh, so he goes, he goes back to logging, and he pulls into Clark Lumber Company to, ha- to sell his logs and get them graded. He, he walks into the sales office, which is Joe Lynn, another elder. He says, Joe Lynn, I got a bone to pick with you. That little preacher back there, your church won't let me join. He says, I'm not good enough. Now, brethren, I never said that. Never said that. And um, Joe knows I didn't. And he says, Richard, what did the preacher tell you to do? He said, well... He said, I needed a Bible study. He said, then that's exactly what you need to do, Richard. You need to do a Bible study. So they came over to the house that evening. We did our third study. We got to the end of it. Richard looks up and he says, "Uh, I can't join this church, can I, Rob? I said, no, you can't. He said, would you baptize uh, Daisy and I? I said, I can do that right now. And I said, the Lord will add you to the church, Richard. And we did. This is Richard and Daisy Pratt today. They're members of the Willette Church of Christ. I see them several times a year. They're some of our closest friends. And uh, if you're not involved in bringing people to Christ, I'm telling you, you're missing out on one of the greatest blessings God can give. There isn't a greater thing in life than helping to win souls for the cross. Brethren, I'm convinced the biggest mistake we're making today in personal evangelism is the lack of personal Bible study. We're not studying this book. We're talking to people, we're, 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 we're kind, we give out benevolence, we, we pass out backpacks and crayons, but we're not doing Bible studies. In fact, this morning, as I talked to that preacher, he says, Rob, we're great in the community, the community loves us, we're all in, we just can't seem to get those good works to translate into Bible studies. Rather than we have an evangelistic crisis going on right now in our churches, and here it is we got little boys growing up and they've never seen their mother do a Bible study. we got little girls growing up and they've never seen their, 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 their father do a Bible study. We've got children in homes right now and they will literally spend 20 years at home and they will never see their father or mother bring one soul to Christ. The average Christian hears 20,000 songs in their life. They sing them. The average Christian participates in 8,000 public prayers. The average Christian is going to hear 4,000 sermons. The average Christian is going to convert zero people to Christ. There is no way we survive like that. There's no way that we're going to be able to grow with those kind of numbers. So here's the good news. I didn't come to reinvent the wheel. I did not come to, to, to say, hey, I've got this new theory. I've got this new plan. I've got this new, uh, new tool. I've got a new book. Brethren, I did not. In fact, uh, when I started this school, uh, someone said, hey, Rob, are you going to, are you going to uh, write some evangelism materials? I said, no, I'm not. But why, Rob? We need some. I said, we already got it. I said, I'm not going to waste my time trying to write new material. I said, brethren, we've already got it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to Bobby Bates, Owen Albright, Mid McKnight, Ivan Stewart, Jewel Miller, Bobby Bay. I'm going to find out what did they do? How did they do it? 
And that's how we started our school. So what's going on in our churches today? Well, let me share it with you. We got youth ministers, teen ministers, single ministers, college ministers, married ministers, divorce ministers. We got parenting programs, addiction programs, depression programs, silver wings programs, golden oldies programs. We have more names for our preachers to date since Peter and Paul. When I go to a church, I don't even know what to call the preacher anymore. I'm not saying it's sinful, but it's a reflection. We have more programs than we've ever had in our life. And we just keep adding program after program. Here's my thought. Where are the baptisms? Where are the Bible studies? Ah, again, I'm not suggesting we should ignore parents. I think we need... Ah, I love what Glenn and Cindy Colley do with their marriage seminar. I love it. I'm thankful for people that are going out here because and, 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 we need them. I'm thankful for the, the marriage seminars. I'm thankful for youth work. I, I think we need good youth workers. But brethren, somehow in all of these programs and works, we have got to include evangelism. If we're going to pack out, pass out backpacks, we need to include evangelism. If we're going to have a, 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 a trunk or treat, we need to include evangelism. If we're going to have a VBS, we need to include evangelism. I'm not opposed to vacation Bible school. Let's just make it evangelistic. Is it possible that we're an inward focused people? Is it possible that we're not looking outside our church building? In fact, is it likely that we become keepers of the aquarium and not fishers of men? We become experts in all these things. I mean, and we're adding. We have involvement ministers. We have community ministers. We have, uh, we have so many different ministries for people. Senior ministers, junior ministers. But where is the evangelism? And so I ask respectfully, how many Bible studies have you done in the last five years? How many times have you sat down with a lost person and, and, and you've reached out and you've conducted a Bible study? That's 1,700 days. I remember David Shannon, I was sitting in one of his, uh, he, he was packed, it was four or 500 preachers. We were all preachers. And we were sitting there and he, he says, all right, preachers. He says, let's, let's, let's be honest with each other. How many preachers in the audience have had a Bible study in the last 30 days? Very few preachers raised their hand. He said, how many preachers in the audience have had a Bible study in the last six months? It was still very few. He said, for everyone that doesn't raise their hands, you should quit now. I was one of those guys. And he pierced my heart. Because I'd been sitting in that church for six months and I hadn't had one Bible study. Brethren, if we don't get back to the basics... Let's look at Matthew 28 real quick, 18 again. Jesus said, all power has been given unto me in heavens and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing. All right, let's just, let's just boil it down. You show me a church that's baptizing people and I'll show you a church that's doing personal Bible studies. You show me a church that's not baptizing people and I'll show you a church that's not doing personal Bible studies. I didn't connect them, Jesus did. I'm not the one that created that connection. Jesus says, you teach and you baptize. So a, a teaching church is a baptizing church. He said, well, we teach every Sunday morning to the brethren. I'm asking, what are you doing to teach to people outside the church building? What are we doing to the people in our communities? Because if we're not connecting with sinners, if we're not somehow connecting with the lost, brethren, we're not going to grow. This is our evangelism model today. Oh, Rob, I had this great Facebook post last night. I made this great podcast. My admonition to every graduate of a school is wait 10 years before you do your first podcast. We have more podcasts than we do preachers, Travis. I mean, everybody's got to have a podcast today. I, 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 remember, I remember Gary Colley looking at me. He said, before you ever go write your first book, preach 20 years. Um. More of our preachers get themselves in trouble because they're, they're, they have no notes. They're just speaking off the top of their head. 
They say things that, uh, that are not entirely accurate. They can be taken out of context very easily. And they get themselves in a lot of trouble. This is not evangelism. Oh, I've got a podcast. It's not, it's, I'm telling you, it's not, it's, that's not what we're looking for here. What we're looking for is a good old-fashioned Bible study. It's worked for 2,000 years. And, and, and that's what we've got to get back to. So what I want to do here before we break for lunch is I want to talk about how you should conduct a Bible study based on what Jesus did. So let's get started. Write this down for me. Defer, don't debate. Everybody write that down. Defer, don't debate. It's the, it's the first principle we teach in our school. you got to defer all questions. No, no answering questions. In fact, if your idea of a Bible study is I'm going to answer more questions than you do, or I'm going to out-debate you, or I'm going to be um, more convincing than you are, you're not getting it. Don't chase the rabbit. Here's what happens. They ask you a Bible question... And you think you're in a Bible study, so you answer and you chase the rabbit. What happens when you chase the rabbit? Well, as soon as you catch it, it's quicker than you are, and it asks another question, and you answer that question, but it's faster than you are, and it asks you another question, and the entire time you're answering all these questions, you're going further from the cross than you are getting to the cross. Brethren, that's not a Bible study. Stop answering their questions. That's rule number one. Don't answer. You're not there to play Bible trivia. You're not there to prove you know more Bible than they do. You're not there to be the best debater and win. Here's why we defer their questions. Number one, they're not asking the right question. Number two, they're not ready for the answers. Now, I want you to think about that very carefully. Number one, they're not asking the right question. So when they ask you a question like, what do you think of the Apocrypha? Well... You know, I'm fully capable of having a discussion about the Apocrypha. And if I need to go out ahead and lay out the reasons why that that's not uh, legitimate, those Maccabean books in the middle of Malachi and Matthew, and those false writings, if I need to make that argument, I can. Are you going to be closer to salvation because of that discussion or further from it? Well, what about, what about the end times? What about, t- tell me about Jesus coming again. I, I want to know more about it. Friends, most people don't know enough about the first coming, much less the second. Why are we sitting there talking about the second coming? That's not going to bring you to the cross. You're having the wrong discussions. Well, tell me about that instrumental music. Is that really where you want to begin a Bible study on instrumental music? I don't. But you know, I used to think when a person asked me that question, man, I'm going to put them in their spot. Man, I know the Greek word asalo. I know what all the Greek reference books say about it. And I can quote them. And I can make my syllogism. And I, I, can, I, can, I got memorized the seven verses in the New Testament that say it. And if I need to win an argument about instrumental music, I'm perfectly capable of doing it. I'll win the argument and I'll lose the soul. I promise. Did Jesus ever teach this? He did. There it is. John 16, 12. He looks at his disciples. He says, yeah, I've got got yet many things to teach you. I've got many things I need to tell you, but you're not ready right now. I can't tell you because you're not prepared. I can't tell you because you won't understand. I can't tell you because you're not there yet. And so what we need to realize is that before you you walk, you've got to crawl. Before you run, you've got to... You know, you got to walk. In other words, you, you, you can't just, just arbitrarily just pick up at, at any point. you got to start people where they're at. And, and if, I, if you were to call me, if, 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 if you were to call me and say, Hey, Rob, uh, can you give me directions to Christian Heritage University? Or Heritage Christian? I, I'd say, sure, I can do that. What's the first thing I'm going to ask? Tell me. Where are you? I can't give directions if I don't know where you're at. When people randomly ask you questions, do you know where they're at? No. And so you're just kind of shooting blind. And I would go home to my wife. I said, honey, you ought to see me. Man, I was amazing. I, man, I really won that one. I, uh, you should hear, man, I convinced them. I was, it was all there. <laughs> it's not a Bible study. So I'm sitting in the living room of Jackie and Sheila Birdwood. And I was, I'm sitting there. She looks at me. She says, Rob. She says, I want to know why you guys don't believe in music. Now, I've got to apply my seven principles. This is principle number one. 
And I did. Now, the old Rob would have answered that question, and I didn't do it. I said, Sheila, I said, uh, huh. I said, you have music in your church? Well, yes. I said, uh, what kind? Oh, well, well, are we sing? And my, my aunt so-and-so plays the piano. I said, got a guitar? No. Now, Rob, that's getting out of line now. We don't do any of that. Just a piano. I said, okay. I said, uh, Sheila, I said, uh, tell me a little bit more about uh, your music. I said, why do y'all have music in a church? Well, you know, you're supposed to. I said, really, why? And we have this discussion. I never answer her question. And I'm not going to. Now, where did I get that from? Let's go to Luke 10, 25. Let me show you where I developed this from. Luke 10. So I'm, I'm, I'm in this study trying to find out how to be a better evangelist. And I've never read a denominational book. And I would highly recommend that our preachers um, care, be careful about what's in your library. Sometimes I think our preachers respect our denominational authors more than they respect the brotherhood. We're always reading the denominational books. I, I, I want to caution you. Go to your Bible. Read your Bible. And uh, start here. All right? So I didn't go to any books outside of the Bible. I went right here. I'm reading Luke 10, and it's right in front of me. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Brethren, if that's not a Bible study, I don't know what a Bible study is. I don't even know what you call it. That's a Bible study right there. So whatever Jesus does, has got to be, it's got to be good here. So I, I noticed he did something that caught, it caught me off guard. He didn't answer the question. It hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm sitting there and I said, wait a minute. He doesn't answer the question. Why haven't I seen this before? Why doesn't he answer the question? I mean, if someone were to ask me, Rob, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I'd say, okay, the start. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Read that for me. I said, now we have faith. I want you to... So he doesn't do any of that. In fact, he just, he, he doesn't answer the question. Let's go to Matthew 21 and let's see if there's a pattern. So I started going through the various questions of Christ. Now, this is an interesting study for me. Because, I've, again, I've never done it like this before. I'm looking at all the questions that, that are asked to Jesus. By the way, there's 307 of them. If you want to write that down. He's asked 307 questions in his ministry. Now, watch what. Here's one of them. Jesus answered and said unto them. Uh, this is uh, Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. And when he was coming into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching. They said, Jesus, by what authority doest thou these things? Who gave you this authority? Is that a good question, everybody? Raise your hand if you think that's a good question. I do. That's a great question. I wish more people would ask that question. Now watch what he does with it. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. He didn't answer the question, did he? Instead, he turns it around and he asks his own question. I thought that's, that's brilliant. And then, then the Bible says, uh, the baptism of John, whence was it, from heaven or men? Very concise question. Look at what happened as a result of that question. They reason. Take your Bible right now, everybody, and circle the word reason. Circle that word. They reason with themselves, saying, because that's what Jesus wants. He wants them to think. If we say of heaven, he'll say, why did you not believe? If we say of men, we fear the people. They all hold John as a prophet. Jesus, we can't tell you. Now watch his result. Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. I'm not telling you. Wow. Now, everybody write this down. Jesus has asked 307 questions in his ministry. How many questions has he answered? Does anybody know? Of the 307, how many questions does Jesus answer? Three. He answers three questions of the 307. How many questions does Jesus ask in his ministry? How many does he ask? 183. When I was a little boy, um, I, I was a pretty energetic little boy. In fact, um, uh, um, the teacher would, would always tell my mother, you know, that uh, we have a hard time keeping Rob still in school. And, um, and uh, I, 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 would, um, I didn't like schoolwork. So I, I just keep going up to the desk. And, and they gave me a sheet that said three plus one. I just, I go, Miss Murphy, three plus one, what is it? 
hey, Rob, go get your blocks over there from the block room, and I bring them out. Rob, count out three blocks here. Count out one block here. Rob, put them together. Count both blocks. How many blocks you got, Rob? Four. All right, Rob, go back to your desk. What is she doing? She's asking me questions. Why didn't she give me the answer? Because that's not how you teach. So you go to, a, I remember the first um, university level class I took. And I'm not talking like, I'm not talking like community college. I'm talking about, you know, this is this professor and he's, he knows his stuff. And I walk into this hall, this lecture hall. And we're supposed to have read this, this, this group of writing, right? And so I'm, I'm thinking, man, this is going to be really good. The first thing he does is starts asking questions. He goes from student to student to student and he asks questions. None of us had read it. He made us look this big. Nobody ever made that mistake again. And at the end of the class, I still remember what he said. He said, hey, guys, class, he said, this is a, what I just did this morning is called the Socratic method. How many of you heard that before, the Socratic method? Okay. Every school teacher does this. You may not know it's called that, but what it is is teaching by questions. And you, you you just keep asking, who's the first person to use the Socratic method? God. Genesis chapter 3. Adam, where art thou? Do you think God didn't know where Adam was? How about, how about Cain and Abel? Where is your brother? Hey, 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 Cain, where is your brother? Do you think God didn't know where his brother was? How does God teach us? He asks questions. He asks the obvious questions to get us to reason and to think, what have you done? Where are you? Brethren, that's how Jesus taught people. Why don't we know that? Because my approach to evangelism was to tell them what to believe. Jesus never did that. Defer, don't debate. Want to see another example of it? This is classic. This is the rich young ruler. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and said, Good master, he said, "Um, uh, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why do you call me good? Look at how he turns that around. He asks another question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why did you call me good? It's brilliant. So the very first lesson I learned in evangelism was I should not be answering questions. I should be asking them. So I take every question that's asking me. I defer their question. I ask them questions about their questions. But I am not going to answer their questions. Because if I answer their questions, there will not be a Bible study. It kills the study. So I don't do it. If you can write this down, this is the principle in a nutshell. He who asks the question controls the study. I'm the teacher. You're the student. I'm not going to yield the floor to you. I'm not going to let you lead me in a wild goose chase. You've got a minefield out there, and I'm not going to step on one of them. You're going to answer my questions. I'm not going to answer your questions because he who asks the question controls the study. Let's go to point number two. Show, don't tell. I'm giving you the seven principles. Here they are. Don't tell them, show them. You've got to show them. You show them what the Bible says. Don't tell them. They need to discover it on their own. It's self-discovery. And if they can discover it without you telling them, it's going to stick. So I don't want them to believe in baptism because I told them that they need to be baptized. I want them to believe in baptism because they've seen it with their own eyes and they've reasoned it out and they know it based upon what they've studied. And so we're going to show, don't tell. Once again, go back to Luke 10. Everybody take your Bibles back to Luke 10. I'm sitting in the middle of the living room. Again, Sheila Birdwell is pelting me with questions. And one of the questions she asked, in fact, this was the transition question. She says, well, Rob, she says... I want to know, aren't you that church in the churches of Christ? Don't y'all believe you're the only ones going to heaven? (laughs) How many of you have been asked that question before? I mean, that's classic, right? And I I knew that when she asked that, she, she, no one's ever, she's been told that. that, that's what happens. And I said, Sheila, I said, that's a pretty good question. Why'd you ask me that question? See, I'm not going to answer it. And she said, well, she says, well, I just kind of like to know if, if you know, is that, if, that, if that's what you believe. I said, well, Sheila, you know, I'm not a very good teller, but I'm an excellent shower. I said, would it be okay to open the Bible and you can read and you'll tell me the answer? She said, Jackie, is he trying to do a Bible study with us? And I said, you call it whatever you want to, Sheila, but I'm not telling you. 
That's the second principle. Let's look at Luke 10. Let's go back to our text. I'm going to, I'm going to take all these from Luke 10 because Jesus uses all of them right here. Luke 10, 25 through 26. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto them, What is written? Brothers and sisters, if we want to take people to the cross, don't we need to do it through the word of God? Let's take them to the book. This is the power of God to save. This is what they need to hear and see. God created the world with his word. By the words of the Lord were the heavens made, by the very breath of his mouth... He formed this world with his word. He can bring a sinner to the cross. We need people in the book. This is the power of God to save. No more gimmicks. No more thrills. We don't need more programs. I went to a church last year, Kirk. I went to a church, big church. And uh, upper middle, I'm talking upper middle class area. And I'm sitting with elders. And the elders looked at me and they said, Rob, we need to do this here. We're committed to do this, but we have a problem. I want to see if you've ever run into this before. Rob, we have 51 programs at this church. 51 programs. And we don't know how we can have a 52nd. Brethren, we don't need more programs, and this is not a program. If that's how you're looking at evangelism as another program, you're, 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 comp- you're on the completely wrong track. Because this is not, this is your mission. This is the only mission. And if everything your church is doing does not revolve around saving souls, then it's not a program that God has any desire for you to do. So I'm not opposed to your backpack program, but it's got to be evangelistic. Everything's got to be about reaching lost people and saving souls. And the eldership looked at me and they said, Rob, he says, our biggest challenge is going to be to, uh, first, we're going to cut our programs back. They're down to about 30 right now. They've kept in touch with me. I'll give them credit through the years. They've really tried. And they've started to implement this. And they started to put it in, the various things in their church. Could it be possible that one of the challenges we're facing right now in our churches is that our churches have never been more distracted in the history of the church because we have so much going on. And then when elders, when, when, you, when you show up and say, we've got to evangelize, say, oh, how can we do more? Brethren, this is the work of the church. And the word of God is the power. So the programs aren't going to save souls if we don't put the word of God in them. Everything we do has got to have this book. And so the key to growth is not a program. The key to growth is get them in the book. And notice what else he says. How readest thou? So what do we need? We need people reading their Bible. If they're not reading the Bible, it's not going to help them come to the cross. For the, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to save. We don't need more programs. We need more precepts. <laughs> we need more Bible. Let me tell you about Scarlett Mitchell. I thought this was a pretty interesting... Uh, well, there she is. So we, um, we were on the phone for like an hour about that, uh, what her conversion. And one thing she said to me that stuck, she said, Rob, when I became a Christian, she said, my whole life changed. I'm the only one in my family. My grandparents all go to the Oak Grove Church. My friends go to the Oak Grove Church. She said, I grew up in the Oak Grove Church, and they were relentless. Scarlett, why'd you leave us? Scarlett, come back. Scarlett, uh, you need to come back, Scarlett. It's not too late. Scarlett, we still love you. Everywhere I went, they're pulling on me. And one day I'm in my house. My best friend comes over. She wanted to talk to me. She, we walk into the bedroom. I said, what do you want to talk about? She says, Scarlett, can you please help me understand why you did this to us? Scarlett, we grew up together. We've gone to this church together. Your mom goes there. Your dad goes there. Your brother goes there. Your grandmother goes there. Your great-grandmother goes there. Your aunts go there. We go there. Scarlett, how could you leave us like this? Do you know how much hurt you've caused? And Scarlett said, Rob, I had it up to here. And, uh, and she said, Scarlett, go be an Episcopalian. She actually said this. Go be a Presbyterian. Scarlett, go be a Methodist. But to be a member of the Church of Christ? Scarlet, I mean, of all places, why them? That was what she said. And boy, that young lady was sharp because what she said, I quote, I quote her in every seminar. 
This is her response. I looked at my friend right in her eyes and I said, uh, do you really want to know why I did what I did? Do you really want to know? And she said, yes. She said, okay. Because if you know what I know, you'll do what I did. Let's open our Bibles and do a Bible study because you'll do just what I did. She looked at her friend and she said, I had no choice. It's what the Bible says. I pray for more honest hearts like that. Through thy precepts I gain understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Brethren, we're not going to grow churches because we remodel the building. I'm not against remodeling, but that's not a church growth plan. I love to teach at universities. Uh, Travis, I'm glad to be here because I can say things I normally don't say in churches. I just don't have time. Let me tell you what happened to me in Arkansas about a year ago. So I'm at a church. This is a big church. They have two gyms. One could be an NCAA uh, playing arena. And they spent a lot of money. One of the elders said, Rob, this is an $11 million facility. <laughs> $11 million. I said, okay, if that's, if that's what you want to do. I'm sitting with elders and preachers. We've gone through it. Their, their members are crying for this. They're begging for it. Um, and uh, the preacher looks at me and says, you know, uh, we've enjoyed this, but, you know, we've got our own evangelism plan here. Now, I rarely hear things like that. Rare. I said, well, what is it? He said, well, we got an $11 million facility. I said, yes, sir. He says, we got a lot of activities going on. We, I don't know that we really need this. I said, how many baptisms have you had this year? How many Bible studies are going on? How many prospects are on your list? What's your baptism goal? What, 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 how, many, how many cards have you sent to the local community? Is it possible, once again, that some of our churches have lost sight of the purpose of the church? That we're not a community center? That we're not the civic center? Brethren, we're not the Lions Club? We're not the YMCA? We're not the local gym? We're a church of Christ. Our goal is to reach people that are lost. But yet, we have, we have some of our churches... It seems that he have lost the mark. I, have, I don't know if I've ever been more disappointed in my life. I wanted to cry. Number three. Plant don't pick. Number three. Plant don't pick. And this one hit me hard because I was guilty of, um, I was guilty of it. Let's go back to Luke uh, 8.15. Let's go to Luke 8.15. Uh, this is the parable of the soils. It's a foundational parable. It's a parable that I thought I knew. I literally thought, I said, man, if, 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 there, was any, if there was ever a parable that I knew, this would be it, right? Because you, you're raised with this parable. I mean, how many of you went to Bible class when you were little? Anybody here? Right? Anybody remember the teacher bringing the, the, the cup in with the dirt and the seed? Y'all ever do that? Put it in the window seal? I, I remember that like yesterday. You know, and, and we're going to put the bean seed in the cup, water the cup, you know, and the, the little plant grows. And we have the, the, the parable of the soils. And uh, every, all the kids bring their, you know, mama, mama, look, and they put it in the window seal. And, and, um, but that on the good ground are they which have an honest and good heart, having, notice this, uh, uh, um, heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. That's a, that's a foundational prince parable. I thought I knew it. And I didn't. So um, I'm ashamed of this, but I, I did. Um, so for there's about a 10-year period in my ministry where I thought that evangelism revolved around finding the right people. If I could find the right person, I'd teach them, they'd be Christians. And the reason we're failing in evangelism is because we're just not finding the right type of people. And I consider myself a pretty good judge of character. And so I'd look at somebody and say, ah, you know, it's not going to work with them. You know, I don't think, not over there. Ah, too many problems over here. Uh, but if I could find just the right person, then I could, um, you know, then I could, uh, then I could be successful. Brethren, that is so far from this parable. That is so uh, contrary to what Jesus was teaching. And I didn't even know it. I was honest. I, I really thought that was the path. Look at Luke 10. I'll show you when I... When I fix this, Luke 10. I'm going to walk you through, again, as we develop these principles. Here's how it happened. Look at verse number 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up. Is this lawyer interested in the truth, yes or no? 
Well, when this lawyer comes to Jesus, what did he do? He's what? What does the Bible say? What is he doing? He's tempting him. So, so let me ask you guys. So, so if you had x-ray vision, if you had the ability of Jesus, and you see a guy come, or, or, or girl, and they come, and they come to you, and they're there to tempt you, and the Bible says he was there to justify himself, so that's what he's there to do, right? He's dishonest to the core. What would you do to him? What would you teach him? I wouldn't. I'd, I'd dust my shoes off and go to the next person. I'm not going to waste my time with somebody like that. They're not, they're not genuine. I mean, if you're not interested, I, I, so, so, but here's my question for you. What did Jesus do with this person? That's my question. What did he do? He taught him. What did he teach him? Anybody know what he taught him? Luke 10, what's that? What's that? One of the most famous parables of the Bible. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus tried to teach this man the gospel. And at that point, I looked at myself and I said, I wouldn't have done that. Now, here's when I changed my ways. A big church in East Tennessee, East Tennessee called me, good-sized church. And they, hey, Rob, you guys are really growing out there at Willette. Would you come and share with us what you've learned and what you're doing? I said, sure. I said, it'd be easier if I could, uh, it'd be easier if I... Um, could bring a group of people and demonstrate it. And they said, that'd be fine. And so, sure enough, I brought about 15 people with me. I brought to the church. The elders were there. They said, hey, Rob, come on in. We want to introduce you to the deacon of evangelism. I said, sure. So we gather around the table, and he brings out this map. The map was quadrant, if my memory serves, into four areas. There was one, two, three, and four. And there was an X and four. And, he, and, and the deacon said, hey, Rob, we're so glad you're here. With your talents and abilities, he said, we really want to send you to quadrant number one. Rob, he said, those are exactly the kind of people we're looking for. If we can fill this church with quadrant number one, we're going to take off and grow. I mean, he's excited. He said, man, we're so glad you're here. And um, I raised my hand. I said, sir, why is there, a, there an X in quadrant four? He said, well, not good candidates for the gospel there, Rob. And it hit me. I just hear that? Not, not good candidates. He said, kind of needy. Uh, Rob, we're just going to stay. But in quadrant number one, that's exactly where we want to get them from, Rob. If we'll send you to quadrant one, Rob, and that is... Uh, yes, Rob? Hey, hey uh, send me to quadrant four. Why in the world would you want to go to quadrant number four? I, I think if the Lord were standing here, that's exactly where he would go. Who gave you a right to determine who gets the gospel and who doesn't? I mean, I was so ungodly. And I was sitting here thinking about, you know, churches today. And, and, and most churches, I'd say this, Travis, I'd say most churches at this point would say, Rob, we would never do that. I agree. I agree with you. But they do it in other ways. Now watch, watch what they do. Um, hey, Taylor, man, I'm glad you're going to join us uh, for an uh, internship this summer. And I, t I tell you what, Taylor, there's some things you need to know about our area. Now, I want you to realize, oh, across the street over there, that guy there, he has got beer cans on his yard every Friday night. Just leave him alone. You can't get to him. Now, on the other side, now, Taylor, that's my best friend, Jill. Now, I don't want you to go over to my best friend's house because you're disrupting our friendship. Just leave Jill alone. Um, we can't reach Jill. She's dedicated to her religion. Now, over here on the other side, that's my mama. Now, Taylor, stay away from mama. We don't want to interrupt family relationships. Thanksgiving will never be the same. Now, over here on the other side, over here, there are two women living together. You know what that means. They're from California. We don't need any of that in the church. Now, on the other side, over here, that's a female pastor. We don't want that in the church of Christ. Now, over here on the other side, that's an atheist. You can't reach atheists. Don't even try. When you're done eliminating everybody, there's no one left to teach, and you're good at it. Now, let me ask you this question. How many of us have eliminated mom, dad, cousin, brother, sister, daughter, son, nephew, niece, best friend, second best friend, third best friend, co-workers, ball team members, next door neighbors, community members? You, can't, you just can't reach them. They're, just, you just, you, they're set in their religion. You're going to upset my friendships. When you're done eliminating everybody you know, there's no one left to teach, and it feels good, doesn't it? Because your conscience is clean. There's no one out there. Let's go to Jamaica. We'll convert them in Jamaica. There's just no one here in the United States. That's where we are. We eliminate everybody in our sphere of influence. We make excuse. 
And so we're pickers, we're not planners. Jesus was not in the picking business. Jesus was in the planting business. Jesus didn't go around picking, he went around planting. And what I find is when people tell me, oh, Rob, you can't get to Ed Goolsby. Yeah, you can. Hey, Rob, you you can't teach that person. Yeah, you can. I love it when someone tells me, Rob, you can't teach that person. I had an elder one time. He was was sitting in my pews, uh, or the pews, not my pews, but the pews. And um, he come always about 30 minutes before church was over. Sit next to his wife. I looked at the elder one day. I said, who is that guy? He said, oh, he's a superintendent of the Methodist church. Well, that's pretty high up. And I said, huh. I said, why does he come? Oh, just to be with his wife. I said, has anybody ever done a Bible study? Rob, you can't, you can't do a Bible study with Randall. I mean, Rob, he's a superintendent. I said, has anybody ever tried to do a Bible? No, we're not. Rob, you just can't do it. <laughs> I put him on my target list. And um, I was... Uh, Randall and I were friends. I'd go visit him, and he had a little farm. And, uh, hey, Randall, uh, you, know, um, you know I'm from Texas, right? He said, yeah. I said, y'all have something called barbecue here. It's pork. It's terrible. I said, in Texas, it's beef. It's brisket. I said, in fact, I've got a smoker, and I'll smoke you a brisket if you'll come eat with me. Really? I've always wanted to try one. I said, yeah. I said, just come on over. So he comes over to the house. I smoke the brisket and the corn. I, I have one mission. I sit him around the table, and we're sitting there. I said, Randall, I said, you come to the church about every, uh, every Sunday and sit with your wife. He said, yeah. How much do you know about the Church of Christ? Well, I guess not a lot. I said, Randall, uh, I said, uh, you like the Church of Christ? Oh, y'all are nice people. I mean, everybody's so nice and friendly to me there. I said, hmm. I said, Randall, would you like to know more about us? Well, sure, I'd be glad to know. I said, I just so happen to have these little booklets. And we started the Bible study. We baptized him. I didn't tell you this part. When I told one of the elders I was going to do a Bible study with Randall right out, he said, I bet you a Coke you can't convert him. He was fooling with me halfway. He brought me a Coke at four in the morning. He's a farmer. That's when he gets up. I told him, keep your Coke, Malin. I don't want it. He says, I was wrong about that, Rob. He just needed a Bible study. Isn't it amazing how we write people off? We don't even try. We don't even, we, we, we don't even tempt. And you know, I, I remember Bruce Bartley. Bruce is another one. It took me 10 years with Bruce. 10 years I tried to get the. I invited him over to the house multiple times. And I kept trying. One day he looked at me and said, Rob, I know what you're trying to do. I said, what am I trying to do? He said, you're trying to study the Bible with me. I said, well, I'd like to, Bruce. He said, Rob, I'm not going to do it. I said, okay. I never give up. After 10 years, I did that Bible study and baptized him. And he's a faithful member today. I never give up on people. I just keep planning. Don't pick, brethren. Don't do it. Look at, here's the principle. Y'all want to see it in the New Testament? Here's his action. This is Acts. So then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first be spoken to you. But seeing you put it off from yourselves. You judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Look at that, brethren. Who picked there? Did Paul? No. They picked. They judged themselves unworthy. So did Paul choose not to teach him? No, Paul tried to teach him. So here's where we need to apply this. Your job is to teach. Let them pick. But never stop teaching them. You never know when they'll convert. The scriptures divide the honest hearts from the deceptive heart, not you. So first principle, defer, don't debate. We all got that, first principle. Second principle, show, don't tell. Everybody there? Third principle, plant, don't pick. Anybody have any questions about those three principles right there? They're simple. They come right out of the life of Christ. They'll change your life. It changed the way I do evangelism. I'm not there to debate. I'm not there to win the argument. I'm not there to have more Bible knowledge and win Bible trivia. I'm not there to play 20 questions. I'm not a punching bag. Let me tell you about... um, uh, Bruce. So um, I did this in Memphis, and there was oh, probably about 100 preachers showed up. And um, so one, pre- one, one, one group of preachers drove from Dallas, Texas, all the way to Memphis to do this. 
And it was really good. And this preacher, he's really energetic. He comes up to me. His name's Bruce. And, and Bruce said, hey, Rob, he says, uh, I, need to, I need to talk to you just for a minute. I said, sure, Bruce. He said, I'm a, he said I love evangelism. And I, I'm not here because I don't evangelize. I'm here to learn more. I said, oh, sure. I, I expect all of you. Evangel-. He said, hey, Rob, he said, my method for evangelism is to answer all their questions. <laughs> he started out like that. I said, great. I said, how's it working for you? He said, man, I got, I got a few baptisms doing that. I said, well, good. He said, what do you think about my method? I said, well, I said, uh, would you ask me that after the seminar? So he comes up to me after the seminar and he says, hey, Rob, he says, I want to take you to lunch, my treat. I said, okay. So he sits there and he, he, he eats a lot of crow, a lot. And uh, he's uh, talking to me. He said, hey, he said, Rob, I'm not out. I'm down, but I'm not out. He says, you'll be hearing from me. He baptizes 15 people in eight months. He just changed the way he did it. So I can give you example after example of people who started to realize that if you apply these principles, you'll change. Your, your whole outlook on evangelism begins to change. And um, let me tell you one more story and we'll break for lunch. I was at a conference for preachers, the largest conference in the brotherhood for preachers, polishing the pulpit. And as I was there, um, there was a member where I used to preach. He came up to me and he saw me. He said, hey, Rob, man, I want to talk to you. I said, great. I said, he said, Rob, we're having some issues at the church. I said, you are? I said, everybody okay? Yeah. I said, but we got this new preacher. And Rob, he tells us the Bible studies don't work anymore. I said, they don't work. I said, what do you mean they don't work? I said, Shelby, when we were there, we went from 110, 120, 130, 140, 150, 160, 170. I said, we did all that through Bible study. He said, yeah, but he says this new generation, what are we, Z? What are we now? Is it A? I don't even know what it is anymore. And he said, they don't like Bible studies. He said, if you do a Bible study with Z, they will cancel you. Those were his words. I said, I've never noticed that. I said, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. I said, they just want you to be authentic and genuine. I said, they'll do a Bible study just like A and B will. And uh, I said, okay. I said, what does he want you to do? He says, well, he wants us to stop doing those Bible studies. They give the church a bad name. And what we need to try to do is just have general conversations with people about the church and uh, be nice, uh, be benevolent, be kind, invite them to church services. I said, okay, I'm, I'm not against any of those things. I said, when do you do the study? He said, that's the, you don't do the study, Rob, you run them off. I said, well, how do they become Christian? Oh, they're just supposed to come forward. Maybe it's just me, Kirk. Maybe it's, maybe it's just, just me. But in all the years I've been preaching, how many people have just walked forward out of the blue to be baptized? It just doesn't happen very often. Most baptisms that happen in a church are a result of what? A Bible study. Someone has sat down and tried to teach them. So I said, all right, brother. I said, uh, just give me the results. He said, we haven't had a baptism in two years. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Brothers and sisters, we need to study the Bible. We need to get people to open their Bible. We need to do a Bible study because it works. This is how God designed it. The Great Commission is a teaching commission. The Great Commission doesn't say go read the book of Acts. I'm not opposed to reading the book of Acts. But the Great Commission says go teach. And so in order to teach, it doesn't mean open your Bible and start in Genesis. What it means is that we need to have a methodical, we need to have some type, that's what Jesus, in fact, take, everybody take your Bibles and let me share something with you. Take your Bibles to Luke and I want to show you how Jesus did this because this is, I think this is very telling. Let's go to Luke 24 and I want to show, so this is after the resurrection. Jesus is uh, concealing his identity to a certain degree. Right? He's listening to the buzz of the day. The buzz of the day is what? Hey, this, this Jesus is risen. We don't know where he's at. And he's listening to people talk about it. He comes up to a group of people and listen, this is what he does. Verse 25. Oh fools, slow of heart to believe. All that the prophets spoke. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? Don't you know this was supposed to happen? Then he does something brilliant. Watch what he does. And beginning at Moses and in all the prophets. Brother, what's your name? Hollis. Hollis. How about if you were there? You're here. You're in the group. And this man comes up and you got parchment and pen, writing equipment. And you recorded everything Jesus did. 
I want you to picture yourself doing this as I read this. And beginning at Moses and at all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, from all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So let's just say, I don't know. I could be off on this. I I bet I'm not. I bet he quoted Deuteronomy, the prophet like in the Moses. I bet he quoted that. I I, I bet he he may have quoted something about the seed of woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of of Jacob and Isaac. He he may have said something about the the Lamb of God. He may have went to the Psalms. And he may have pulled some things out of the Psalms. He may have went to Isaiah 9, 6. He may have gone to Isaiah 53. He may have quoted it, in fact. Hey, let's just suppose, Hollis, you wrote all those passages down. And then when you finished, you said, that was great. Hey, what if I bound this together and called it like back to the Bible or something like that? How did Jesus teach people? Do you think he said, just read the book of Isaiah. Brethren, if that's how you got to do it, we're all in trouble. Have you read the book of Isaiah lately? We're all in trouble. That's not how he did it. What he did is he took scriptures and he took them in their context and he put them together, rightly dividing the word of truth, the sum of thy word of truth, Psalm 119, 160, 2 Timothy 2, 15. He puts them together and he does a Bible study. And that's how he did it. If that's wrong, then then I'm wrong. I want to tell you about this guy that won't take take lunch break. I got about, about three minutes. Perfect. He said, Rob, when I grew up, he said, I grew up in a church home, a religious home, not a church home, meaning I went to churches, it didn't matter where. I got about 18 and and, and 19 years old, and I was looking for the purpose of life. I didn't know what to do in life. And my dad joined the Navy. He was in World War II, and he says, I decided I'd join the Navy, and I'd learn the purpose of life. So I went to boot camp, got deployed, went overseas. I was there a couple years, came back, went to Lexington Park, Maryland. Rob, I learned something about the Navy. I said, what did you learn? The Navy does not know the purpose of life. I said, well, how did you find the purpose of life? He said, I looked in religion. I visited every church around Baltimore, Lexington Park. He says, and I went to church, to church, to church, and I had my Bible. And I was just looking for a church that used a Bible. Rob, I couldn't find a church that used the Bible. He said, there's very little Bible in these churches. He said, one day I saw a sign that said Lexington Park Church of Christ. So I decided to go to that church. I walked in, and sure enough, the preacher opened the Bible. And it's all he used was the Bible the whole time. The church was hospitable. They surrounded me with love. They invited me into their homes. I never took a taxi again. They picked me up to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Most loving group of people I've ever found. And all they did is use the Bible. One day the preacher looked at me. He said, hey, uh, you want to come over to the house? And uh, I got a movie, movie to watch. And I said, well, great, man. I'd love to watch a movie. That preacher actually had an old reel. He had it set up with a screen. And we watched a movie. I said, what'd you watch? He said, Jewel Miller film strips. He said, on May 16th, 1965, Rob, I was baptized. From a Bible study. Now, why did I tell you that story? Because that's my dad. What would have happened if my dad did not have someone do a Bible study? Because of that one Bible study, my dad goes back to Bettsville, Ohio. It's a very little town. He's going to find a church of Christ. He found one church of Christ meeting in a home, small group of people. He walks walks inside and sitting on the front pew, there's the preacher's daughter. He'd sit next to her, and uh, he likes her. And uh, the preacher invites him to the house, and they have dinner together, and they start getting to know each other, and uh, well, he really likes her. And the preacher, he said, one day, Rob, uh, the preacher came up and said, what are your intentions with my daughter? He said, we got married. <laughs> he said, because of that one Bible study, Rob, I'm, I found my wife. Because of that one Bible study, Rob, I, I had you. And you grew up because of one Bible study, and you grew up and became a Christian. Because of that one Bible study, your sister, Christina Barkley, she grows up and she becomes a Christian. Because of that one Bible study, you're going to find your wife. She was my sister's roommate at Freed Hardman. And and when my my, my mother met her, she calls my dad and she says, Gary, we found Rob's wife. We got to bring her home for spring break. Mama literally brought her home and said, that's your wife. And I did exactly what mom said and I married her. 
<laughs> I'm serious. And, uh, and so in and so any case, I said, uh, I said, because of that one Bible study, my sister goes to Freed Harbor and she finds Joey Barkley. They get married and they now have Barkley Farms. It's, uh, it's right around Freed Hardman. A lot of people stay there. And uh, because of that, that one Bible study, they have two girls, Maddie uh, Barkley, Michaela Barkley. They grow up, they become Christians because of one Bible study. Who did your study? Who did your study? Who did your study? Who did your study? So when are you going to do yours? I know you did. Brethren, we're not going to grow until we do ours. We can't wait for them. They've already done their job, Travis. There's no more mid-McKnights. I can't wait for him. But there's Travis. There's a Kirk. There's a Taylor. There's a Carol. There's a Hollis. There's Rob. Brethren, the only way we're going to get out of this hole is we've got to do Bible studies. We've got to teach the church how to do this. It's called congregational evangelism. Not everybody has to conduct a Bible study, but everybody's got to be involved in some way. So who do you know right now that needs a Bible study? Thank you all for listening. I really appreciate your kind attention. I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to come back uh, probably here as soon as we're done with lunch. We're, gonna, we're just going to walk over here to the cafeteria. I think they provided Chick-fil-A. Is that right, Travis? Now, how could you miss up Chick-fil-A? And I don't know. And uh, the number three is always the same. So, <laughs> and, uh, let's, is, it, is it okay we pray? Can we, let's pray for it. Our Father, we're thankful for uh, this day, for our blessings. Father, we're thankful for the food you give us. We're thankful, Father, for uh, this gathering. We pray for this school as they uh, reach out to train Christians. We pray, Father, that uh, uh, souls would be strengthened. And, Father, that evangelism would be um, uh, the center point of life. And, Father, that reaching the lost would be the goal of every Christian. Bless the churches in this area, Father, with a, with a zeal to reach out and to, uh, Father, to teach the lost. We pray for Brother Kirk Brothers as he oversees and administrates this school, for Brother Travis and there's so many others that are involved. And, and Father, we thank thee for the work that's being done and we pray that it would be all to thy glory and honor. Forgive us of our sins, Father. And uh, may we be more like Jesus every day. Bless us food to our bodies and give us strength throughout this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.